And let me ask you a question. Where are you guys from? San Diego. San Diego. And how'd you, what'd you do? You drove here. Why'd you drive here? We wanted to see this. <laughs> Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher and Billy Dee Williams are here. When you watch the movies, you can tell that they were made by people who really cared, cared about, about what it. they were doing. Seeing this part of it filmed, and there's all of the props around, and there's people lying on the ground, and, and it's all cruddy. But you know that, that they're going to take it back and put in the opticals, and it's going to be totally different. I mean, so we're, all, we're all in Tatooine right now. Yeah. So that's terrific, you know. <laughs> By the time all nine films are done, it's going to be like, I mean, I don't, I'm <laughs> afraid to see what you guys are going to come up with. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Yeah. I've always called it a space fantasy designed to be a modern fairy tale. Hopefully it will, you know, justify it as a series, make you say, gee, what happens next? I think the real satisfaction will come out of completing what we started out to do. And I don't think there's been anything quite like this, you know. A beginning, a middle, and an end. It is the final chapter. It's the big finish. So all stops are out and uh, it's all go. Today is day one of episode nine, and we're starting uh, on the Falcon, which is uh, incredibly surreal to be back. I never in a million years, never thought I'd be back on the set. I'm so excited. It's not remotely what I'm sure it was like for the legacy actors to come back uh, at all, but it is a strange thing to return to a place that you have fond memories and feel like you got to do something very special and sort of dodged a crazy bullet and was like, oh, I did it, and now to be back here feels uh, really weird. We came into that first movie with a lot of trepidation. All of us, you know, knew that we had this huge weight on our shoulders. And now to have everybody coming back and working together, it's kind of like the family coming back together. I can't believe it. And that's made it really nice. We all know each other. The crew are used to each other. Oh my God. And now to finish it off with JJ is a blessing, you know. And so I just get to enjoy my job. It's not just the end of three movies, it's the end of nine movies. There's a lot to uh, consider, but I couldn't be more grateful and I couldn't be more comforted by the company I'm in. I come to Star Wars first and foremost as a fan, so I have extremely high expectations. And the world of it means so much to me that I, I'm not easy on it. And so we haven't been easy on ourselves. This is their creative faces. The creative people try to come to a decision and they do faces like that because that's what they do. That's how we um, create and get to a and make real Star Wars decisions. <laughs> and then, uh, okay. We'll do a thing, what do you say? I'm going to rewind this and watch it. <laughs> Every day we ask ourselves, how do you end the story that George Lucas started so many years ago? How do you end this myth that's become a myth for the whole world? Rolling. Rolling. Moving. And we're flying. Set. Set. And action. Action. The fun begins. How long before you can make the jump at light speed? Take a few minutes for the Navi computer to calculate the coordinates. A few minutes? Are you kidding? At the rate they're gaining. Uh, you know, what is it? <laughs> you have to shoot this. Traveling through hyperspace is like dusting, ain't like dusting crops, kid. Without precise calculations, we fly too close to a store. <laughs> They're bouncing to a supermarket and then. <laughs> yeah. Be a hell of a mess. What's that? Watch. It's, we're losing the deflector shields. Go strap yourselves in. Be careful on the way out. Yeah, sure. I'm taking very close. Okay. You. <laughs> Go away. 
Without him. Too near a supermarket? <laughs> it's a righteous challenge, you know. I think for the last movie, there is such expectation and such investment in these characters. Where are you skipping to, Poe? Scary places. Whoa! Oh, Seeing Poe and Finn and Chewie in the cockpit has been an extremely fun and sweet start. And now we're doing a uh, quick Looks test with Daisy. It's a pretty good thing, so nice. No, I saw we're just kind of trying to finalize the look. I haven't seen it. I mean, I saw the rough one. An outward reflection of my inner soul. Um, what's going on? How are you? I had a proper long sleep last night. It's been like quite a long build-up of freaking out. Yeah, it's nerve-wracking. I don't really know how to describe it, but I feel more the expectation of what people want for the last chapter. I do remember what my first week was like, because we were in um, Abu Dhabi. You're on Fatima, and then you look at the ship. Yeah. It's sort of the same levels of nerves, actually. There we go, that's better. So I remember it vividly. And the whole week was like, Ugh! and it was both amazing and terrifying. I was doing my walk along the desert, taking off my Stormtrooper gear. Go. It was very hot and everything looks very big to me. Like, I was like, why is this camera so big? Like, why? Like, everything is just huge. Um, but it was fun. I was, I was getting used to a whole new world. When Oscar came into audition, obviously I had the, the role before <laughs> Oscar had done it. It was, it was more of a technical. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't call it an audition. An audition. You know, you know, more of a read. Yeah, it was more of a. But he read the scene, and I was kind of like looking at JJ, like, what are you doing, man? It's him. Come on, that's just wasting time, man. And it's nice to be able to that's actualize right. that chemistry that we had on that first read. Thank you very much. We made it one day, day one. It is my honor to be the one to introduce back to this universe Mr. Billy D. Williams. Quite pleased about <laughs> this whole situation coming back as an elder statesman. Will you die in the movie? Uh, no, <laughs> not yet. Anyway, <laughs> no, I understand they want to carry this character on, uh, continue. I think he's going to be part of the heroes. You know. Well, look at you, a general, huh? You look damn good. So I'm going to set it. Let's do it. I love the whole idea of a movie like this because it talks about the classic question, you know, about good and evil, and what prevails and what doesn't prevail. You can throw some things to knock at. Like LED. <laughs> you said it, Chewie. One last time. Good Gonna use your help out there. How'd it go? Not well, actually. It is the first movie that you know, ostensibly, this new generation had to carry on their own. As the end of eight left the resistance, you know, in kind of pieces, they've set up camp quickly with what they've been able to resource and access. It's weird coming back and, and kind of feeling this, like, earned confidence of having done it before, but also knowing that there are still going to be times when you're figuring well, things out and it's different and new and scary, but you can get through it with the people that you're working with. I love it. I like it. It's really good. You want us coming through? I say hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Making JJ laugh is my number two priority, you know. <laughs> Get the shot, nail the acting, make JJ laugh. Go the challenge for the designers and for JJ was to create an environment that looks temporary and sort of ad hoc, but also has a bit of, of the soul of Star Wars in it. Amazing guys. When I'm in there, I can go. Yeah, go. Yeah, go. 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 Let's go. Much. Look straight. Yeah, that's it. That's amazing. Really? Yeah, bloody hell. How much you lifting in the gym, bro? Yeah. Your whole situation in here, boy. Yeah, man. We'll put a microwave in, a little yeah, TV right. on the side. That's what I'm going for. Home sweet home. As we decided that we would link this place with Leia's past, it all started to come together. Kevin has the idea we could put the blockade runner in the middle of the cave, and that's why they're hiding out. That way, every time you turn around, you're going to see the blockade runner. The blockade runner is the first ship that you ever see in Star Wars, the ship that is running from the Imperial Star Destroyer. 
It's the first time we ever see Princess Leia, and so it was trying to link this last film all the way back with the very first film by saying, this is how we've introduced her, and this is how we finish her journey within Star Wars. When we were doing Seven, she knew that that movie was very much Han's story, and then Eight was very much Luke's. You know, the thing she had said was that Nine should be Leia's, uh, and that's really something that we've tried to do. We lost Carrie before the movie began, so that was our first discussion, really. It's how on earth do you tell Episode Nine without Leia? We couldn't let Leia not be in this story. Action. Ray? Leia is extremely important as a part of the conclusion of this saga, so we had to figure that out. May the Force be with you. That's beautiful. One more time. That was great. I will probably always be identified as this person. Vivian Lee was always Scarlett O'Hara, except to Olivier. I don't know. I will probably be Princess Leia till I'm 85 years old. Are you happy now? <laughs> I give George huge credit for creating Princess Leia. Certainly one of the feistiest female heroines ever in cinema. You know, in the fairy tales, a princess is to be rescued. And she was far from being a damsel in distress. A little short for a stormtrooper. Huh? She found both Han and I incompetent. You call this a rescue? Give me those guns. <laughs> it still makes me laugh. What the hell are you doing? Somebody has to save our skins. She's just authoritative and just plows ahead. It doesn't matter. Let's go through this shower of asteroids. Who cares? And my hair won't get messed up. So, uh... She's, she's different from, I like her, I like her independence, and I, I do wish that I, I had a little bit more. Come on, let's just walk through the traffic. It doesn't bother me, it's not a, you know, I won't get hurt, there's a sequel. So, on that level, I envy her. I admit it. I don't know, the, the luck, the serendipity of the fact that we had this footage that we didn't use in episode seven, and you know, really meant a lot that it had been JJ there directing her and he was confident in partnership with his editors and visual effects supervisor that we could use that footage and it would be 100% Carrie Fisher. Week one, we were pulling dailies for them to start writing a script based on lines of performance that hadn't been used. And then Chris phoned me and she'd say, we have this one line, how many takes do we have? What is she doing? How does she look? How does she say the line? What I felt like with JJ was he loved these films in the same way a lot of people do. They're part of your childhood. And so there's a tremendous responsibility to, to that, to this thing that he treasured, but he seemed completely up for that. They had so much fun on Force Awakens and we all got along so well. It was actually my first movie I ever did. This is my yeah, yeah, yeah. daughter, the unlegacy, the legacy of the legacy. I treat it incredibly personally and, 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 and I think we all will very carefully to make sure that those scenes are both serving a, a, a story purpose and entertainment purpose but also honoring her and the character uh, which is you know a, a real point of this movie. Carrie was such a wonderful special person and I loved her dearly and so there was the personal aspect for all of us that knew her but also technically how to, how to do it and do it in a respectful seamless clever way. Instead of trying to integrate Carrie into a scene, we actually had Carrie, and then we just built the entire scene around her. We were initially creating storyboards to be able to fill in what the scene would be that, that wasn't the actual Carrie footage that we pulled from episode seven. This mission is everything. We cannot fail. Roger, Marianne, and I then cut the scenes together to demonstrate to JJ what it could be. Do me a personal favor and be optimistic. He could then visualize conceptually, oh, well, we definitely need these shots. We don't need those shots. We're able to sort of recreate kind of everything as faithfully as it was on the day building our movie around her. And so that involves figuring out the staging of the other characters as well. It's literally like a gift from her or her forcing us to make her the star of the movie, but <laughs> probably both. This is the first scene that we're doing with Leia, and uh, of course, we don't have the most important person with us. 
I would say we should have a moment of silence, but that's the last thing that Carrie would stand for. Um, so instead, I would say let's have uh, every moment be one of celebration for uh, a woman we love, a character we love and admire. Thank you. The reality of having to do a scene with someone who isn't actually there. Yes, master. Was very difficult. I sort of had to walk off and have a moment. Being back has been incredible, painful, surreal. All of the adjectives that you can come up with, probably I felt. <laughs> It was a hard day, but it was a, it was a good day. We've had tears and we've had, you laughter, know, laughter and memories. Yeah. And the fact that there were so many people around talking so fondly of her and, you know, sharing our memories yeah. of her, you know, and with Billy to be able to listen to, you know, how people think of her mum, you know, it, it's amazing. Yeah. There's no one in the entire cast and crew that was more supportive than Billy. And so to know that we were doing this with sort of her at our side, that's something I'll just always be grateful to her for. I'm so happy. And she would be happy that it's her movie too. questions at the beginning of this as far as Leia's force strength. Did she train as a Jedi? And the decision to make her part of that story was a pretty exciting one to us. You see the saber fight between Luke and Leia trying to use two performances of Mark Hamill and Carrie at the appropriate age. And in fact, Leia is being played by Billy, her own daughter, which is amazing. There was this idea in Return of the Jedi that there is another, and of course it refers to Leia. And we thought that was kind of a, a promise that had not yet been fulfilled. So when she says at the end of episode eight, we have everything we need. It felt like the perfect transition to this story where we come in and discover that Rey is continuing her Jedi training, but she's being trained by the other Skywalker. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to watch an actress come into a role like Rey and to be 19, 20 years old. Even the idea of getting strong physically, all of that was new. And now, as she's emerging as a powerful Jedi, Lost and, back. Yeah. Okay. and you're watching her as Daisy actually move through that process, there's an interesting parallel. A bit of dialogue, a bit of dialogue. I went into it knowing that I wanted to be healthy, doing stuff that literally feels good for your body. So I was sort of combining a number of things. So I was doing essentially bodyweight training five days a week and then kickboxing twice a week. One, two, three. Dialogue. I took karate, uh, kendo, and did a little bit of weight training. They sort of want to mix that martial arts flavor in with the traditional foil fencing. That's good. All right. Okay. All right. Here we have to rest now. Okay. Watch it. All right. I can't talk now. I'm out of breath. <laughs> it's difficult. It's becoming better than ever, Flynn. What do you mean by difficult? This is unusual. You know, I haven't seen this one before. Then you pull the saber out. Here we go. You know how this is going to go. Yeah. It hits you immediately. This remote droid is molded from yeah, the, the original yeah. mold from A New Hope, the one that they used then. So that's exactly the same as what you saw on the Falcon on the New Hope. Sick. That's not a good rhythm. Oh. Let's do a stab. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, like that. That's what it'll do. You ready? E like, it wants, to be really, it wants to be really annoying. Yeah. There you, <laughs> there you go, that's it. Go that's it. That's go the feeling. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's go it. Can I get me go on? It is like that though. That's what it is. Yeah. That's exactly right. Eunice, just a tremendous stunt coordinator, amazing force of nature. She just came across as a breath of fresh air, someone who would attack this with a with a passion that JJ would respond to. 
she she's done the tightrope going. Yep. She gets gets the uh, the ribbon. Yeah. Uh, now she's running back. Yeah. Thirty foot's quite a big gorge. It is. Do you yeah. like the idea that there's like a half fallen tree and she sprints up the fallen tree so it just pitches it off over the gorge a bit and she gets the height coming to come down you on. Believe it more. You would believe it more. Oh, yeah. yeah, cool, cool. All right, nice. <laughs> Just walk it to the end. Here we go. And then remember that strong takeoff changes the whole body language. That strong takeoff. Okay. And when you cycle through, forget about the wires then. Just bring your arms through. Yeah. Okay? Okay. It's funny because I had heard various things about Eunice before I met her. People go, people call her intense. With intention, Tommy. I'm intense. Oh, I'm intense. Oh. I'm not tense at all, I'm having a lovely time. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> uh, she's just got the most amazing energy all the time. This is all you, forget the way you're doing this jump for real. Yeah. Just drive. Set and go, sir. All right. Roll cameras, please. Down speed. 16 Lima. There we go. Two. Set and go, camera. Three, two, one, action. Thank you. Yeah. And cut. Great job, Dizzy. I don't think Great job, Dizzy. Uh, I, I think I've seen you do that. Yeah. It's like didn't hit the wire. Good, 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 weird. Eunice came over to me at one point. She goes, Do you think you were as intense as last time? I was like, That's not the question, is it, Eunice? You're asking me to be more intense. Just ask me to be more intense. She's like, Yeah, yeah, be more intense. I was like, Okay. Set, energy, and go. Camera, three, two, one, action. Drive, Psycho! Yeah. Good girl, that's the one. That's the one. Good girl. Hey, great job, Dizzy. That was great. The excitement on Eunice's face when we nail it, she's just like, ah! I mean, it's just so, you're just so happy she's happy. <laughs> so, I think every truly... stunt that happens, she <laughs> actually projects herself <laughs> into the role and she's doing it. Her entire mm. body is moving in front of the monitor when she watches every little detail of a stunt. Eunice has a confidence that is really exciting to work with. She's ferocious in a way that you want people to be. And when you have people like that, then you trust their opinion. And it challenges you to make it better and more specific. There was no icebreaker with Adam. You just, it's like, boom, and that's it. But I, I actually love it. I, I love it. I, even in rehearsals, Adam's in character. I'll go, Adam, you need to step out more. It's closing your strength down. And he's like, no. No, I don't need to step out more. Kyla Ren wouldn't be like that. He, he wants it there, he wants it there, and I'd be like, yeah, but, yeah, but. And we'd have this, this like, argument, but I like it. Character is her starting place. It's never from spectacle. It's always from within. He was like, so this is how it is, Eunice. I do all my own stunts, and I'm like, yeah, here we go. I always hear it. I go, Adam, there's a level you can do, and there's a level you can't. No, 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 you're not hearing. I do it all. The physicality of Kylo, I'm very protective over. So you kind of, I wanted to do all of the, the uh, uh, all of the things. I was like, well, okay, if it looks good, you can do it. If it doesn't look that good, I'll be putting the stunt guy in. It has to look good. So, um, but he did everything. At the start of the movie, you find Kylo the most assured of, of the choices that he's making, going deeper and deeper into the dark side. The thing that JJ said to me when we first met was that I imagine a journey of a character where it's almost the opposite of Vader. Someone who almost starts the most vulnerable and kind of gradually becomes closer to his convictions, more assured about his choices, had metaphorically and physically killed his father. The unique and very deeply emotional and troubling way in which Han Solo meets his fate helps realize the full potential of the character that Adam Driver plays. 
What is it in the human brain that gives us the capacity to be as evil as human beings have been? That's what I wonder. I wonder how can those people possibly exist? Compassion and greed. We all have those two sides of us. We have to make sure that those two sides of us are in balance. What happens when you go to the dark side is it goes out of balance. At the heart of this movie is a darkness. It's part of Ray's journey to confront this darkness that's been there from the very beginning of The Force Awakens. We knew from the beginning that there would be a heart of darkness structure to the movie and that this would be about Ray's journey to the darkest place both in the galaxy and for her. But we had to work a lot to try to figure out exactly what that was, exactly what it meant, how the past would come into the story, how the present and future would interact with that past. The idea came up of, well, what if Palpatine lived on in some way? Within about 30 seconds of discussing that idea, we just knew that it was the right idea because we knew that this has always been a story of Skywalkers and Palpatines. It's a generational story, and the, the idea of the story of these grandchildren grappling with the same things that their predecessors had dealt with. It just felt poetic. My favorite scene from the prequels, Palpatine telling Anakin the story of, of Darth Plagueis the Wise and his obsession with cheating death, and it sits there like the greatest setup of all time. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. So it could be this unholy combination of trying to prolong life both through medical means and through dark magic. I love that he already looks like his action figure. <laughs> I feel I've been lucky for the third time. When George saw me for 10 minutes all those years ago for Return of the Jedi, I was suddenly the Emperor of the Universe. So then to get this call, it was once again a, a, a third time extraordinary experience. This is fantastic. This is so good. Is it still insane? It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> it's actually getting more insane moment to moment. <laughs> Welcome, young Skywalker. I have been expecting you. It's like he has this instrument that can go from, you know, a whisper to this, you know, mega roar. It sounds like he's got a tiger purring in his throat, and that makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck. This is the full emperor now, bursting forth, as he always was. And it's clear that although I have the best makeup artist in the business, he doesn't. I hadn't seen him in his garb till on the day, and it was awesome. The way it's described in the script is so creepy and so weird and unsettling. I just want to see Ian be the Emperor again. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. Look what you have made. The idea that this is an ancient place, a place where maybe the Sith really began in the very beginning. The ideas are not just coming from the script. There's a visualization process that also invokes creating ideas. This feeling is so dramatic, you know what I mean? This like tumultuous, stormy feeling. It would be great to talk to Dom about like what methods we may be able to employ to create that sense of it's a crazy storm and just do it, you know, in camera. One thing JJ was always impressing on me was the fact that Ray must feel small. We must feel like little people in a massive world. The context of it is I'm under the most, gotcha. I'm, a, I'm a, an ant right. under the shoe of a right. giant. When we made these, a man was going to be about that high. Now a man's going to be about that high. So these are absolutely giant. The thing that we're talking about is if we cast someone that we want to see, the mask becomes something that's a choice. And so his putting it on, yeah. it's almost oddly a vulnerability. Putting on the mask makes him feel more powerful. JJ wanted Kylo Ren to have the helmet, yet we had to address the fact that he had destroyed it in episode eight. There's a technique that the Japanese use when they have broken pottery, and they put it back together with gold. It's always very evident that the piece was once broken, 
Rather than do the gold, we did a bright red. It's really nice to be killed by his lordship. You know, if you've got to go, then that's the way to go. So you'll be sitting... Uh... <laughs> One of the background players is none other than the granddaughter of Sir Alec Guinness. Sally Guinness, right here. Sally. Action. It's just very exciting to be here. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. I've gone to the dark side, apparently. <laughs> Isn't it sad what's happened? Roy. <laughs> 217, take nine. One second. And set. And oh. five hundred. At. So, we've just received news that. Send another battalion. This is a moment when things are getting particularly bad for the bad guys and so I wanted it to feel like things were a bit out of control but the, the idea is to kind of try and find ways to keep the thing alive it's not like an exercise in how much can you do in one shot it's the longer you can hold on something and watching it actually happen the more exciting it is Cut. Cut. Great job. and then it ends with a close-up on our friend uh, Richard E. Grant you know you can't do wrong with that guy we recovered the scavenger's ship, but she got away. For Star Wars geek, it's, it's, this is a dream job come true. You feel like a kid in here, and I've seen other crew members do this as well. Even though you know it's switches and buttons, and that doesn't work, this impulse to just go up and press things is, is very strong. It's like being a kid in a sweet shop. I mean, there's some pretty big name actors in this, and they all feel the same way. We're all like, yes! <laughs> I've said to JJ, can you just pinch me to know that I'm actually here today? So, that's my feeling about it, undisguised delight. Because Donald's such a good guy, it was extremely enjoyable to pull status on him. I have the very great pleasure of being uh, shown the door by Richard E. Grant, which is lovely. So it wouldn't be so bad to make sure that, that when we do, <laughs> to have a Star Wars gun to take out General Hux was an extraordinarily pleasurable thing to do. Tell him we found our spy. Bye, 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 bye. The other two I enjoyed while I was making them, but there was the stress of first time of it being the first time and then the second time of everything being different and uh, this time it's really nice just to kind of allow yourself to sit back and look around a little bit and remember how amazing it is to actually be in Star Wars. The more emphatic you say yes, the funnier I think it should be. I'm the spy. What? You? Yes. Hang on. Yes. You? Yes. We don't have much time. Yes, we don't have much time. Yes, 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 we don't have much time. Yes, we don't have much time. <laughs> that laugh was good. <laughs> I think myself and Richard had competitions to see who could forget their line first. They overpowered the guard and forced me to take me through the ship. Oh, f that up. It was a co oh, f What is it? Sorry, what's his name again? It was a coordinated incurment, Allegiant Pride. F Jesus, I said pride now. <laughs> Cut. At one point, I did have to shamelessly request of the director, could they please write this one sentence that kept jamming in my brain on a piece of card so that I could at least look at it? No, all on, it's peaceful. We have no weapons. You, you can't... You would prefer another target, a military target, then name the... Blah, the uh, name it, now! Well, a lot of times, it has impossible dialogue to say. You can type it, like Harrison says, you can type it fine. There's no way to say it. The actual production is shot in England, and also Star Wars, by the nature of the exotic environments that we deal with, we sort of travel all around the globe and uh, have things going on on various continents, actually. Evangeline and uh, Levon. 
There are no roads here. There's no facilities, there's no bathrooms, there's no power. We will have to play a little because their eyes are magical and they don't want to lose their eyes in a profile. There's no food, there's no potable, drinkable water. When they go to look this way, this one will come this way. We'll so this one could track that way. Yes, here, exactly. Here. See, and I see he this one's eyeball it. the whole so time. So maybe that way, a little bit like that, we see yeah. in profile. No Wi-Fi, no internet. There's none of that. All right, as soon as we're getting this filter, ladies and gents, stand by to shoot, please. There are no buildings here. There's nothing to age where we are. It's timeless. The Wadi Rum Desert was just epic. The vastness of the place already feels like an alien world. I always like going on location. It gives much more of a real gravity to the scene. I understand it more. I feel like I'm really in the environment. It feels like a proper journey. We were in the desert for the first one at the very beginning, and now we're here for the last one. It wasn't the first desert I'd been in. I'd been in Star Wars since day one out in Tunisia in 1976. Sand dunes and all that. This was the desert in Jordan that Ralph McQuarrie must have had in mind when he, he painted that original picture of 3PO. These strange, craggy shapes with a kind of miasma of sand below them, so the whole thing kind of melted into one. It, it was, it was heart-turning. In a way, it was like 3PO coming, coming home. Okay. Hold on. Am I in here? Yeah. No one understands 3PO at this point better than Anthony. Oh, yeah. Uh, I visited Anthony at home and he showed me some of the dialogue looping notes from Star Wars, the, the first Star Wars and from The Empire Strikes Back. So there are handwritten sheets that say, I'm not going that way, it's much too rocky. Or the moment in Empire Strikes Back where he says the chances of successfully navigating an asteroid field are 3,720 to 1. But in the original it had said the chances of successfully navigating an asteroid field are 3,725 to 1 and he changed it and got rid of the five because the rhythm was better, yeah. the, w the way that it ended up in the film. You know, on the other shot, uh, when I says to R2, you know, come on, let's go, yeah. I've already seen them, so they ought to be kind of in the doorway. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to cut it. But... That whole end of it is a little tricky. You just throw it all away. You cut me out of this, make it easier. He has a way of tilting his head or raising it back that's, you, it just, it says more probably than a person would do. The face itself has no expression, but I find working with Tony Daniels, who plays the part, you read expressions into that face. To me, he has an incredibly mobile face. He looks quizzical, he's, uh, you know, when he's in danger. I can't stop myself making all the faces and smiling or frowning, looking worried. Even though I'm way behind something, nobody can see what I'm doing. But for myself, I'm doing all the actions. And people come up and they take the face and they say, oh, I'll try this on. And they put it on and how they take it off again because they can't bear it, you know. I don't know, there's something wrong with me that I can put up with it. What do you think? Would you put your head in there? Uh, neither would I. But I rather love 3 P. I I think he's, uh, he's a nice guy. I think he gets <laughs> a rough time, but, but that's part of the, the magic of it. I remember at our cast dinner where everyone had started reading the script and Anthony hadn't read it yet. So he kept hearing from everybody, oh my God, 3PO's role in this film. Suddenly 3PO was part of the team again. Not since really the, the very first film had 3PO lived such a full life. It's been gratifying to give Anthony a role that was bigger and to really let him go along on the adventure because he has been along on the adventure since the beginning. Start shooting the Festival of Ancestors, which is truly insane. I've never seen anything like this before. And the amazing thing is, that's literally the line in the movie that Ray says. When you think about Ray's journey through these films, she hasn't seen a lot of joy. 
She has only seen the hardship of growing up as an orphan, and then she's seen war. And the, the point of Pasana, the, the world that we discovered and created in Jordan, is for her to see celebration and abundant joy. The Akiakis were actually a design that, that, that happened quite early. But if you bend over and do this, you keep your arms long, I start to not quite understand mm -hmm. what the yeah, body shape is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you guys wouldn't mind all just bending your knees and keeping your arms long, you know, and maybe move your head forward a bit, you know? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Maybe if we did have some prosthetic legs to kind of see for a couple hero yeah, ones, yeah. and the legs weren't so just human legs with stockings, but like, we changed the anatomy a bit. Yeah. That could be actually interesting. Yeah. And if we just saw one or two, you'd be like, I get all of them. There's a few lines in the script that hint at what this might be. And then when we begin obviously talking with JJ, we begin sketching ideas out and coming up with something that's that's you know feels like it may be a desert a desert creature that, that doesn't feel misplaced here. Baby rhinos, things like elephants, all these things are quite good places to quite good creatures to look at. And obviously with Michael Kaplan and costume, when Michael started to engage them, the shape becomes a little bit more understandable. Each one really requires a lot of fabric, and so it was finding the, the, the correct fabrics. We had to make a lot of trips to different countries just to find the quantities we needed. We found a lot of fabrics in Italy, outside Florence, in these massive warehouses. The most amazing thing about them is just the sheer volume. We were given the daunting task of casting 450 uh, creatures, Aki's. We were talking about how could we achieve this. Obviously, we couldn't fly everybody in uh, and, and hotel them. There wouldn't be enough hotels, there wouldn't be enough infrastructure. So the idea was working with the Jordanian soldiers and local Jordanian people here as well. The first part of today, we'll be learning the ritual dance. Left. Right. Left. Make a noise. Five, six, seven, eight. Again. They just became so involved. Five, six, here we go. One. Then they got into it. And all of a sudden I started to see it, how it's going to be in weeks to come after the boot camp week. Again. And then obviously filming. Here we go. Five, six, here we go. JJ did come along and his feedback was great. He absolutely loved it. So take 10 minutes, get yourself a drink, have a breather. We'll all come back. You know, talking to the performers, I mean, for a lot of them, they've never done this type of work before. It's the first time for them, and they're excited. I felt awesome. I felt like a real alien. A real Akiyaku. The more I'm in it, the more fun it becomes, and I'm having, like, the best time. It's really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the main thing. They're excited, they're into it, and they want to do it, and that's all I could ask, so it's great. And then we're going to put it over Rob's head. <laughs> And that was another army of people that were involved in that, just to get the creatures ready. Normally we're used to a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, or you have sort of two or three people to dress. And this is sort of so constant for the two hours that you've really got to push them through. Right, we're just plugging you in, cabin. To get all those aliens on that set on time and to have them trained and be dancing. Is that all right? Yeah. That was pretty remarkable, I thought. We first came here in April, and there was nothing here. We scanned this whole area, and ILM helped put together a virtual, virtual version so that JJ could walk around with the headset back in the UK. Set deck designed all the tents, and now it's October. We've been here six weeks putting this up. So now to have the tents here and everyone in it is, is quite special. We're excited okay. to get, get filming.
I can't believe what we're doing. I know. I know. We're basically bringing the most insane, massive puppet show to Jordan. The head shake is, is amazing. Yeah. A little bit more shake, Liam, on the head shake. I hope it works. That is so good. It was a little bit like putting on a, a big show event. It didn't feel like filmmaking. It felt like something much more carnival about the whole thing. I must say, I'm very proud of all our crowd. And they're being very patient. It's a very hot day today. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen so few wayfinders. The enthusiasm and joy that they have brought to it, their commitment, is extraordinary. I've got to kind of keep my cool and stay professional about it. But working with, with JJ has been amazing. We also did some little Aki children as well, which have a little part to play. And that was very sweet because they were all hand puppets and we literally dug a trench and put nearly 30 puppeteers beneath them. It's a three person puppet each one and we've got 14. So there's quite a lot of us underneath the floor here. Well, they do a sweep for scorpions first thing in the morning before we get down here and scare them all away. We did see some scorpion tracks in the sand uh, the other day. So that was quite exciting. Yeah. You're actually seeing a kind of version of the world of Star Wars in one area. What you're seeing is the galaxy that is worth fighting for. And you got the gun there, like that, you're training it. Just literally relaxing that at all, I was uh, shot by Chewbacca in The Force Awakens. Hey! And now you're going to be shot by... Lando Calrissian, apparently. I've been told. I don't know if that's true. Just imagine that the second here. Yeah, yeah. Now can't. the lights are out. Yeah, yeah. Lights are out. I hope that that's true. I sort of gradually work my way through the entire cast. Maybe everyone can have a go. Action. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Stunt in the sand there. Almost. Yeah. That'll be all right. Oh, that was pretty good. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah. All right, so if I can just do that. The stormtroopers have discovered us, and we have to run away. Easier said than done in my case, of course. We've got a ton to do. We had a 20-day schedule. We decided to make it a 16-day schedule. The work hasn't changed that significantly, so it's not easy here. You see all different departments working really hard in can be some really quite challenging conditions. Well, it's uh, quite dusty. Hot, hot, hot. And then, you know, you have your occasional dust. It's quite hard to work in the desert. Everything takes a little bit longer. That pesky sand and the wind get in the way. My name is Ali. This is my first production. And I just want to see Chewbacca, man. Chewbacca, holla at me. I love you. I love you. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonas, Jonas. Chewbacca's my hero. <laughs> this is amazing. Our bad boys end up going that way. It's an amazing exercise to do second unit, I gotta say. Attack it, attack it as it changes, be malleable. We are doing a really exciting explosion where we have three cameras. All right, here we go then, guys. We're shooting. We kind of only get one chance to get it right. I don't think there's one person here that would want to be anywhere else right now. I'm pretty sure. And three, two, one, bang! We are here to safely drown the heroes in sinking sand without scaring them or injuring anybody. And we've dug out this, this huge hole, got a crane in, lowered in all these containers. Thanks to the local army, because they provided the digger and the, uh, the labor to do that.
So there's various rigs involved, one of which we can literally drag them all the way under so they're completely covered in the material. Well, there's a couple of rigs where Daisy Ridley in particular, she can crawl through the beans to get to Chewbacca. She stands here and she sinks down through the sand as she's moving forwards. So we're using a combination of materials, like this is one of them. We're using black beans in order to simulate black sand because they're much easier to push through. One, two, three, four, five. Ah. Black. See, it's easy to find the set because it's all the black sand here. Black beans, no one goes in it. Okay, apart from the effects team and the stunt team, there's very detailed protocols that Dominic has for how we look after the actors. What the hell is this? Say Kingfield, try to grab something. The beans would just come and cover us up, and you have to kind of hold your breath for a little bit, you know, until they said cut, and then they would lift them back up and you'd breathe again. And that was a little freaky sometimes. <laughs> Hi, John. I liked him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I get a bit claustrophobic. I remember coming through the first time, and it's, you sort of have to hold your breath and like panicking. I got stuck in the air bubble. Good work. I think people were sort of joking about it, but I really, it was. Oh, it was, yeah, awful. Ah! Ray! Look, I never told you! What? No! No! And cut, beautiful job. And it looks amazing, but it was awful. You go into a sort of quicksand, but then you end up at the underside of the quicksand, which is something JJ's always wanted to do. What's underneath all that? Oh, I'm so good. This is like the thing when you're a kid, you know, it's quite you don't quite know where it goes, it doesn't go down forever. And then essentially, as you always are, whenever you do something like that, you're, you're in the subconscious. Now you learn things. What do you learn? You learn what happened to her parents. You learn about her ability to heal. even when faced with something that could be perceived as threatening. And you look and there's a snake, a giant snake, a huge, scary, giant snake. Oh my God, oh my God. And it goes out. Oh. And Anthony. There are so many new characters and situations and effects. I thought they would have used them all up on the first Star Wars. And, you know, I arrive in the studio and there's something quite magical to see in some new monster. I saw one today, great sort of splodge thing. And uh, it's, of course, great fun to act with all that, and it's very stimulating. I couldn't believe what the creature department had come up with. The most wonderful piece of engineering and puppetry, because Various members of the team were, were coiled inside the clogs and sort of rolling it and slithering it. And, and at the back, somebody's got this main arm, you know, woof, and the face is coming out, you know. Well, what's the the swing left and right. Being like a big multi-person a puppet, we all have to work in synchronization with each other. And if, if one of us is out of time, it kind of throws the whole thing off and it can look a little bit clunky. So yeah, we all have to kind of tune into each other and really feel it. This is my favorite part. We wanted to have something for the actors to react to, so they had a pretty um, impressive stand-in version of that creature. That creates a much more immediate performance for JJ to watch and look at. And can the snake in that position come back anymore? There's some shots where, you know, you could still use the puppet, but for the most part, we basically replace it with a CG version of it. Look how really low that is.
you can sort of be like, it's like it's sort of taking something out of you, but you're kind of focused on it. And then it could do the inhale. Wait, wait, let me just Good job. Good job. Right. Great job. Take any longer, I would have gone and got a popcorn. I'll tell you what, weirdly... I felt such a connection with the snake. I'm not joking. Are you kidding? No. Because I totally did at the end when you were healing it. Yeah. That's amazing. That's what acting's all about. You can't sort of go home and rehearse your reaction to a nine-foot ice monster breaking through a wall. You know, you just have to go on the day and, and see what happens. But uh, it's never dull. <laughs> I'll be right behind you. It's fine. What if your sort of soulmate in the force was your enemy? As she's walking out, we'll sort of arm out as we're extending. Circumstance pits them against each other, but the force bonds them together. You'll walk out basically maybe this direction. Yeah. The saber is in your hand here, yeah? So try the other, turn the other way. That's actually quite better. That way you get the saber coming across the camera. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They understand each other almost from a point of view of fate, and yet fate has made them enemies. And three, two, one, go. <laughs> that cut. That's so good. It'd be cool to do a couple versions. One that's more determined, one that's more afraid. Explode that much that say bang. I know what I mean. Like just for that and that and then just go into okay. And then I can make it like a quick like, yeah. like step back. Yeah. Shooting. Because of its luscious nature, there's nothing like watching film. Seeing that the exposure is right, that everything's right. Three, two, one, go. I love shooting things practically. And cut, great job. Oh, great day. Uh, there's just a reality to framing something up and how the camera moves. And if she lands here, we should be good for, for Carlos and for you. Lovely. Let's get the drawing up in the air. Thank you. Here we go. And three, two, one, action. That's incredible. Yeah. Awesome. Can you play and it's 60 yeah. frames? It's tougher emotionally than I thought it would be. The stuff with Adam always has been so emotional, trying to find that balance of feeling the light side, but also feeling the draw to the dark side. I love my life. I love my job. Oh, no, it's beautiful. beautiful. I'm so excited. He learns it over the course of the movie that they're two halves of the same thing. I think it just, if anything, reaffirms what he knows intuitively and has known for a while, but hasn't been able to articulate until he can. We did versions when I'm just looking at it and versions when I looked at my hand. And doing it felt horrific. And that's really, I think, obviously, when you start to see that all is not well. When they finally have this confrontation, despite it being this battle seemingly to the death, he clearly has interest in her beyond just killing her. There obviously have been questions for three films for Ray that have culminated in this. And it feels, having done it, that it was the only way she was gonna get back to herself, is answering those questions that are like lingering, lingering, lingering. They're looking down at the play, okay. coming up to her, and then over her shoulder, keep standing there. That was the thing I said to JJ, oh, I hope Adam and I have some stuff together, because it's nice seeing the differences. I don't want it to feel like episode eight, Ray and Kylo. So it has to be beyond then. There has to be rage there but also there has to be sympathy and understanding and an actual connection. And Adam, turn 
Clockwise, I guess? A little more in the book? Yeah, yeah. And then days come to your left to touch more. Okay. So the fourth connection, which becomes the fight in his quarters, took like two or three days, and it was pretty tough. I think that was the first fight we did. And so in my mind, I thought, oh, we'll just have pickups in Kajimi. That'd be great. We'll go to Kajimi. And then we were shooting outside. It was absolutely freezing. And there were really technical things we had to do. And some of the moves were really difficult. And I thought, oh, I won't have to do these. And then obviously I had to do them. Go! Baker 124, Charlie, take three. I was nervous about the fight because he's enormous. That was really my main worry. But then once we got into it, it was pretty cool because it's more like a choreographed dance. And it felt like it really paid off because I think we both really knew what we were doing and how we were feeling and it was, and it was great. They sold you to protect you. Stop talking! The set of Kijimi was one of the wildest I'd ever seen. It's epically big. It has got street after street. It's like stairs leading to stairs. The walls were easy, the windows were easy. Bloody rude. 400 construction guys, it's like running an army. Where is this in the script? Well, this is, a, this is the Kijimi, the snowy planet. We wanted to reference Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. The original two guys in Hidden Fortress were basically the initial versions of 3PO and R2, two people in a bigger adventure. I went to high school in Japan, and when I walked in, these looked very familiar, those roofs. You know, the walls, the sloped angles, and the giant flagstones, it's very much based upon our tribute to Kurosawa. The idea for Kijimi, what it looked like, what it felt like, it was really just, here's a, a corner of the galaxy that we should take a peek at to see what these villages are like when the First Order has occupied them. You guys are like, let's get out of here. Back, and back. Start to walk off. Because yeah, it's the first slam, I think, and then the whole thing would be a little riskier. It's quite cold up here, isn't it? Amazingly, Star Wars has these big, beautiful sets. You're not imagining that much of it because you're actually in them. I just feel like I am in the galaxy right now. I'm gonna win. Ready and back in, civilians, troopers. Three, two, one, go. We knew that we wanted to learn more about Poe. We wanted to learn more about Finn. But the, the challenge was to do that without stopping the film. Sometimes it takes a couple tries, you know? A couple tries. A couple tries, you gotta, <laughs> you know, a couple tries, I was like 29. Was it? Didn't feel like that much for me. They're everywhere. We gotta find another way. There's an Arthur Miller quote, which is that every drama is a story of the birds coming home to roost. And I think that's somewhat true for everyone in the story. Oh, and the way that he left things with Zori comes comes back in the film. Heard you were spotted at Monk's Gate. Thought, he's not stupid enough to come back here. I love that we get to go back to when he was a young, scrappy guy. Poe and Zori have history. Okay, well, you had a little, little moment in time there where he was caught up in the spice ring. I think they were like a lot of people in Star Wars. They were, they're surviving in the only way that you can. You were a spice runner? You were a stormtrooper? Were you a spice runner? Were you a scavenger? We could do this all night. You know, she takes a guy up. No, we're just going to try and She's just really cool. Bounty for her, just might cover it. I have three kids, but there is nothing I have ever done that my son has thought was cool until this. So, JJ? Yes? 
it will be the twirl on one and the pull out on action. Okay. So Carrie, the gun goes up on action. Two, one, action! JJ told me he wanted it to be always this kind of alluring, wondering who she was, like seeing people and them not seeing you is very unnerving. And action. I've saved up enough to get out. I'm going to the colonies. You wanna come with me? When the, the visor comes up and you see those eyes, uh, that ended up being one of my favorite scenes to shoot because it's a real moment of connection. And you often don't see Poe vulnerable. It's, it's that way that sometimes these people from your past that knew you in a different light, they say that thing that reminds you of who you are. Spectacular. Yeah. Babu Frick's Joy Chop, and we've made hundreds of robot parts in the Setec um, props department. And if you look up, you'll see various heads, some of which have been seen before, some that are brand new. Forever banging your head. Possibly, if anyone who knows the Ralph Macquarie concepts. And that stuff based on his. Well, intricacy is closely interconnected to a complete mess. So we've got one or the other. I'm not sure which. Our team is luckily very well versed in Star Wars. Greebles. Greebles was the word apparently invented on the first Star Wars film. And uh, there are numerous pieces of greebly, which is an English term for dressing on the barge, aircraft pieces that are made to look in into a kind of a space configuration. It's to make something look more technologically advanced than it actually is. And it can be as simple as just adding a couple of little buttons and a little shiny thing. It can be a verb or a noun. We will greeble that. Find some greebles. We're out of greebles. This has taken, I think it's about two to three months to get this quantity of stuff. And that's a team working every day churning stuff out. We've also made a very special gallery of items to commemorate the participation of John Williams. No way. Here, let's do it. John Williams was having lunch with Kathy Kennedy, and the idea of his being in the movie came up. Kathy told me, and we were, we were both like, well, we have to do this. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't want to. That's too silly. I wouldn't possibly do that. And then I mentioned to my wife, Samantha, and she said, oh, you have to. That's more important than doing the score of the film. You've got to be in it. 3PO looks at you, and you just don't like him at all. And you can even kind of shake your head a bit and go back to your thing. And you just, that's, that's the moment. And the camera will push in, and do it and it'll be fantastic. Okay. I can do, it. do you mind do if I make a, a little small embarrassing speech? Do you mind? Okay. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, and I think everyone kind of does, and is probably giddy in their own way, but just to say it so we're all well aware, we are in the presence of a supernatural genius uh, someone who uh, does the impossible, uh, someone who is now an actor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only maestro, Mr. John Williams. Forty years this soon. So we're going to play now the last piece here, which was the first piece then. In 1976. 1976, when I was 12. <laughs> okay. And it sounds like this. One, two, three. The first film, I, none of us had any idea that, that we'd ever hear the music again. It feels very privileged to have been able to do all of them to this point. I don't think there's anything quite like it in the history of film that we have the opportunity over decades to take the same material, use it again, and add something to it, and revoice it, and rework it. Each 
and every time there's some amazing theme, something that in three notes, you know exactly what it is. The music he writes is so profoundly good and impossibly moving, you just can't believe it didn't exist before you hear it. It's just, it's very strange, his, his superpower. And equally amazing is just his nearly insane humility. Like, he writes something and then he'll conduct it and it's just, you're crying. And he literally turns around, he looks at you, he's like, is that good? It's good? Yeah. Wait, what's going on? All I can do is put notes on the paper with a pencil, you know, and it stops there. And I needed an orchestra to play the music. And it stops there. And then you need to have the third element, which is the audience, sending back what they send back and then that completes a circle and that is what musical communication is about watching him work is amazing and he's such a nice guy oh. racing with daisy that that's for you okay that's all right huge you see here this i is think i'm gonna look at any fingerprints on it <laughs> Oh, come on. That, that's her, her first page. He's had 51 Oscar nominations. <laughs> and we thought it would be fun to do something as a kind of celebration of what he's done and who he is. You are surrounded by all this apparent junk. Yeah. Every single item has been very purposely chosen to represent one of the 51 Academy Award nominated films that he scored. <laughs> <laughs> so not only there's Hook over there behind you. Oh my God! This is Jaws. There's E.T. Saving Private Ryan. Tom Sawyer was a little interesting to figure out. We figured corn cob pipe. That's from the book Thief. We've put letters uh, from the Star Wars alphabet, all brush. Uh, it's J T W, which is John Williams's initials. Oh, there's the whip from Indiana Jones. That's the iron from Home Alone. See, back up. I mean, literally, isn't it crazy? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Isn't it incredible? Unbelievable. Each piece. This is, this is ridiculous. No, it's, it's great. <laughs> to have him in a movie and just see the man that we've been listening to all our lives who's been moving us so profoundly. So it was a blast to get to work with him in that way, and he was so, uh, he was so lovely and, and seemed to have a really good time. Great energy, here we go, set. Three, two, one, action. <laughs> Bobby Frick, can you help us with this? Now this is the one that does the operation on 3PO's circuitry, right? Bobby Frick is a rod puppet, which goes back to ancient way of puppetry. So it's, um, you have your puppet and you just stick rods on the limbs and puppeteers will move it, breathe life into it. <laughs> That's great. So that's the simplest version of him. But obviously we would mechanize the fingers and the toes and mm -hmm. the face and all of those things. Oh my gosh, look at that. This is particularly small for an animatronic head. Isn't it? I bet. So we're going in this tiny head, there is 13 microservos. And wow. uh, they're all individually powering just so we can mix it up a bit. You know, on the original films, I was never in my uh, dressing room, you know, when I was, wasn't in a scene. They always knew I'd be in Stuart Freeburn's shop. I remember Stuart whipping up the green foam that they were gonna pour into the Yoda mold. He said, you wanna pour some? I said, yeah. Are you kidding me? The most complex one, the most sophisticated one is the smallest one, that is the Yoda. He's only two foot high, and of course, he has to have all the um, animation that's possible to give him, which is difficult on such a small creature. He, he could even steal the picture. And that, that would be great if he does. It's just such a small space to work on. So uh, it's just getting as many expressions in this little head as possible. Partly because it would be great to have on set and partly because I want to prove it to myself that I can put a lot in a tiny head. It's a 
but the more impossible it is, and in the end you succeed in doing it, that's when, of course, it's that much more sat satisfying. So keep in mind, this is the first time we're seeing him, so you've got to be like, here. Yeah. And, and maybe uh, some quicker blinks, you know what I mean? Maybe just so he's like a little bit more like, like alert, you know what I mean? That helps. Yeah, that's great. Is that unusual for an actress to be doing that, or does she have puppeteering experience? Well, it's not common, no. I met the creature team, they were amazing. And they handed me this machine and said, I've got to learn how to work the mouth very quickly. And I didn't know that was going to happen. So that was a bit frightening. It just, is a mouth right in there. Can you see? Mm -hmm. So if I do this, E, E, M, B, and I'm This is actually the first time we've done this, where we've had the talent <laughs> uh, performing the mouth at the same time as delivering the dialogue, which is good fun. Yeah, really good fun. fun. And she picked it up really question. quickly. Thank you, Matt. A lot of the time we would have another puppeteer do the voice on set and then they would dub it in ADR afterwards. But it's great because the character is so strong and what, um, what Shirley has done with the character is great. So it's really good to have that ability for the other actors to bounce off what she's doing. And action! Good, the looking up is great. Okay, great. <laughs> I work on anybody who needs an accent, but I also make up new alien languages. I was doing these things and Joe was hearing it and she was describing it as if like things are shutting, like things are clasping, clasping, all that kind of thing. And we sort of we played it was like the around. beginning of this sound to babble, you know, to find, find babble. Yeah. It's pretty great. It's the blank, blank, the bye bye. <laughs> It's discovering it as you're and feeling it in your body. But then I believe it that way, and I offered it up, and then JJ picks the bits that he, he believes. Yes. Yes. That's one of my favorite little plot twists. 3PO losing his memory. Rich with comic potential, because you know he's sort of written to get on people's nerves. <laughs> but he always has really funny lines. I've forgotten how much I abhor space travel. You know? I always picture 3PO being be much happier you know, at the opera, serving hors d'oeuvres instead of rattling through space. 3PO is, uh, I think, very like an English butler. He's that particularly British sort of person, very archaic and rather uh, out of his time. And action! And consequently, he finds all the things that happen in Star Wars, you know, the battles, the explosions, all the nasty characters like Darth Vader. He finds that very worrying. Tony! Repio is in some ways the observer of all things and the memory of the saga. So when we were playing with different plots for 3PO, it, it felt like it was in his DNA that one of the plots was he should lose his memory because he's always the one who's observing and commenting on, on everything. And if 3PO loses his memory, it's as though the crawl would disappear because 3PO is the, is the keeper of the, of the story. You're going to have the back of your head off now, and the wires will be coming from that. If we make him translate it, he won't remember anything. Wait, remember, go blank. Blank, blank. <laughs> if this mission fails, then it's all been for nothing. All we have done, all this time. Often Star Wars characters sacrifice themselves. I mean, think of Obi-Wan Kenobi. He went to battle the dark side, Darth Vader, and sacrificed himself for everybody. And now 3 is doing the same thing. And you know, he's, he's not too ready to do it because he's gonna be destroyed as himself. There'll be a spark, which you probably hear. As soon as you hear the you can just, yeah. Action, working, working, working. Three, two, one, fire! The fact that 3PO is willing to sacrifice himself is because he belongs to the, the team. He loves the team, the humans. With 3PO, I really, I think he's one of the more human characters in the, in the, in the film. Might I introduce myself? I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. And you are? Okay, that's gonna be a problem. Hello, I'm Bubble Freak. And then, even from right here, you're going to be like, that's, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> classic. You got, you got classic Poe. And so, then uh, you might actually go from Zori's line to the close of, of Babu saying, oh, it gets a strong. And action. Go, 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 
things. thing I've ever seen. It's like more people than I've ever seen concentrating on one thing at a time. It would be up there a bit just because of the scale of it. Yes. If you look at it from, a, I think, a wide shot, you'd see an arc. Perfect. Okay, great. The atmosphere is just so friendly and like welcoming. It's backwards. Oh, you're saying, and you're looking into it. <laughs> it's also really lovely to see the whole cast come together and to know that I'm like, the new girl, but like part of that same team, part of that same family. It makes the bigness of, of this film a little bit more personal. First positions, please. All right, here we go. Okay. 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 Ready, set, and go. Jana, action. Action, horses. Rough landing. I've seen worse. I've seen better. My first day of Star Wars was definitely memorable. It's like a stimulation overload. It was just like, all of the things, like so many people, so many animals, <laughs> so many flies. All the flying ants rise up from the ground and decide that it's their time to, you know, do whatever they got to do in the air. <laughs> and bugs, man. It was funny on set, you know, when stuff like that happens, we all kind of just react in a normal way, laugh by it and keep on moving. They swarm you, they ate you. They were stuck everywhere. They got caught in my fro. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> that's that's filmmaking. Like you can't control those things, and like, but you still get the job done. Unfortunately, our stormy planet isn't quite so stormy at the moment, so sadly, <laughs> we're waiting out the sun. Just the practicality of working under those conditions, you know, there are different issues that that creates, challenges that, that you know, you have to overcome. Hey, so we're going to give up on this shot because it's never going to get cloudy and it's going to keep getting more and more frontlit. So we'll bail on this shot, do it another time. We should move the shooting code down below to the low level. Clear frame, and we are rolling. Crane action. Seven of them are heading up the hill. And they see out into the stormy madness beyond, and they see the wreck out that way. One of the ideas JJ brought back to episode nine that initially he had thought of in the early days of episode seven was going to a crashed piece of the Death Star. I was just fascinated with the, the question of what is it to live in the aftermath of everything that we saw in the original trilogy. So the idea of pieces of things that we had seen that, that had been blown apart. There was just something that was kind of haunting about it and kind of beautiful. It was one of those things that felt like an idea that you have suddenly finds its purpose. For a long time, we knew that there was going to be a moment in the story when we we're going to see the Death Star. First thing we kind of wanted to do is go up into the archives and take a look at the original model for this star. Look at this weird core thing. I don't know if we can get some of that into our yeah. approach to Ray. So we went up, took a bunch of photos, we wanted to really understand the curvature that houses uh, the dish and then the texture itself. The texture of the Death Star is just as identifiable. You can see these kind of banding, which when you get really close, you understand, oh my god, one of those bands is actually the trench that Luke flies down. We came across a really big issue in that it is completely 
ridiculously huge and found out that it was about 90 miles across. It's too deep to fit in the ocean, it's too tall to fit into the atmosphere. So we found out that we could just barely fit the dish way out on the horizon. That we we're pretty happy with. And JJ looked at it and he kind of said, it's a little too convenient that we just happened to come across the dish. So we kind of reset. Maybe you would have just a piece of the shell with a little bit of the dish left in there to hopefully recognize it as what it is. From the sky, BB-8. It's a bad place. From an old war. And then she'll pull out the blade and watch it widen out. Even while we were dealing with these big epic things in this movie, we found that the smallest details could sink you, like the way that the blade interacts with the next stage of the journey. Trying to get that right became a real challenge. This one here, you thought about being on leathers or, you know, so when it was flat, you'd run sunlight, right. you'd literally see all the way through it. It could just be much more sink than a slab or tablet. To be honest, the scrolls, it feels like a physical object. Right. I don't know. Ah, this thing. You know, this particular item, it's just been something we've been kind of, not kind of struggling with, I think it's just struggling with the whole idea of where it leads, just because it's such a story point. If the right idea showed up, it would, it would actually help the story, so it was, it's helpful to look at these, but I don't know if any of these are the right idea. It would have been, we're saying it was made after the, after the event, second Death Jedi, Star. Yes. the second Death Star, to pass on the information about where the Wayfinder was to other Sith. Like, would it have to have been hardier because, you know, it would have had a pass from hand to hand to hand. Well, it's like this. We've all seen knives that have a shape. If that cool design happened to have its function, it was a map. What are options for ways that things could, could be pulled out from, or extracted from, or removed from, or adjusted on a knife? I mean, I was imagining sort of something where it's like, if this came down, it would be one yeah, thing. One. And I just love the arrow. So you go, that's where it is. That's cool. That's cool. The Wayfinder's there. So for the interior Death Star, JJ wanted this to sound like this creepy haunted house. Scary winds, creepy metal creaks, weird whistling sounds. And so we just kind of by accident happened to find this structure that was made out of uh, shipping containers. So it was a really windy day and it was the craziest sound when we were inside, all that metal and creak and banging. It was like, oh, th this is the Death Star. This is exactly gonna work for the Death Star. What more fitting place for Ray and Ren to have their meeting than literally on the ruins of the war that came before? We thought, well, surely the place that they have to meet is in the throne room, which involves both of their grandfathers and involves their shared history. legacy set designed by Norman Reynolds, which is the throne room. It involved building it all pristine originally from the original blueprints and then destroying it. We managed to fish out of the archives some of these blueprints, original drawings from the original set build. And from this, um, I was able to recreate this in 3D. So we created complete models of the original throne room. So this mezzanine level here, we imagined that it entirely collapsed through. So you get this really nice full view of the window there, which is all destroyed. This is the Emperor's throne, and it's fallen from the floor above down into this floor, which is where Darth Vader and Luke fought for a bit. When you're building destroyed sets, yeah. it's very hard for it not to look fake like it's been cut with a saw. So Claire drove over it with a forklift. 
<laughs> we do, I drove over panels to make it look better, yeah. Let's try one, please. And you can see it in everyone's faces when they walk on that set. That's Mark. In the throne, they're just like, can I sit on it? And you're like, no, hell <laughs> you're not allowed. What was never in the original films is a secret vault room accessed through his throne room. So we've taken a bit of liberty Apparently. so that actually it was always there, you just didn't notice it. The idea that she's so crazy powerful with the Force, you know, so quickly, for us, we always felt that there was a connection between her and something that would help explain some of these things. Obviously, you know, it needs to feel like she is really contemplating it and that the, the need for revenge, it sort of overtakes everything else, which it does for a moment. And then she's sort of reminded of what it all means and what's at stake. Right from episode seven, from the scene in which Ray is interrogated by Ren, it's clear that they have a connection, that they understand each other, that they can literally read each other's minds. They're made uncomfortable by it, and yet they're both drawn to each other. Of course, episode eight furthered it by creating the idea of force connection, and I think what we wanted to do was complicate that and say, actually, their their, their connection is, 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 is deeper than that. We began talking about them as a, a mythic concept, which is in Joseph Campbell, which is the, the mythic dyad, that they're, they're two parts of the same whole. And then finally, we, we began talking about how if the dyad ever came together, its power would be immeasurable. When we first read the script, I um, offered to JJ that we could do some, some wave effects. And uh, at first he was kind of like, yeah, yeah, good idea, good idea. But, and then we showed him some tests. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so cool. There's 15 cans there. I, I think that we would do them in... Yeah, we could let five go and... Exactly. Them, and, then you, and then we'd be filling <laughs> up at the same time. That really is my favorite thing I've ever seen. It's like, Oscar, can you just come for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not in that... No, I just want you to just, just sit right there. <laughs> That's incredible. Don, that's awesome. We knew that there was going to be a central fight, and we wanted it to be the saber battle of all saber battles. We really started thinking about making it as operatic as possible, and sort of reducing the scene to just them and the elements around them, so that the epic quality of this duel would be matched by the surroundings. <laughs> Girl, let's go. Come on, time to go. The fight felt so ferocious. It needed to be really full of like rage and incomprehension and, and all of that. Ray needs to go on her own very individual journey. That side of things doesn't involve Finn, doesn't involve Leia, doesn't involve Poe, no one else. No! The thing that became more challenging is we were being doused in water cannons and it was November in England. The water would come. I would be like, oh, I can't breathe, kind of cold. Hot water bottle, it's freezing. But that was fun. It was really physically exhausting and you were like wet and soaked and cold and on wires. I loved it, you know, it's like, what? how, how many times are you gonna get a chance to do that? I did want to murder Dom special effects because there were a few times where they said no water cannons. And when I say mid-scene, literally a dump of water on my head. I remember watching the top of the water just starting to come over. And I watched it was like slow motion as it rained down on Daisy. And the true professional that she was, she carried on, but I could see in her body that she kind of tensed because it was cold. And as the water settled and they said cut, she shouted out very loudly, Dominic! Of which I didn't want to be on the set at that moment in time. But then people really thought I was really tough after that. And JJ was like, you have so much crew respect, so it was great.
It's actually my birthday one of those days. I don't know if that means anything. It's not like I wanted to kill her more because it was my birthday, but it was really exciting. You know, huge water cannons are shooting how many thousands of gallons. You're exhausted, you're tired. It's like, it's great. That's it's what you kind of hope work is. Kylo's journey really opened my imagination as an actor. Things had come to almost full circle with him. For the first time, someone had shown him what I think maybe he perceived as a, a huge act of generosity in spite of what he, he had done. Yeah. Someone like kind of reached out when no one else had for a long time. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Repeating the same exact scene from The Force Awakens line by line, I thought was a really beautiful way of showing, is he real, is he not real? Is it, is it a conversation that he's been having for years in his head on repeat? Yeah, I do. It's both ambiguous and totally clear. It's not that I wanted Han Solo to die. I wanted Han Solo to be able to lend some significant emotional weight to the story. His destiny is um, resolved in a, uh, I hope, a powerful and, and effective way. The theme of redemption is important not just in Star Wars, but in life. I mean, no one's perfect. Jedis make mistakes. I think it's comforting, the idea that despite having done wrong, either intentionally or unintentionally, they're able to right those wrongs and be forgiven. It was probably nice for Mark to be more like the Luke of old, which I think JJ felt like he really wanted that. It was nice to feel, and even in the scene, to feel really comforted that, like, oh, Luke Skywalker is here. That's kind of good. I wanted to find a way to show that Luke, even in death, was a Jedi Master who was helping the next generation. We thought about Empire Strikes Back and how the one thing that Luke doesn't manage to do in Empire is raise his X-Wing out of the swamp in Dagobah. When we saw in Episode 8 that the X-Wing was under the water, we thought, well, maybe this is the way to bring it full circle. If there's any lasting legacy of the character is the idea that you can accomplish anything you want if you are selfless and willing to do what's right for the greater good. You know, he was a, a symbol of optimism and I, I, I think that's probably 
the most satisfying aspect of the character. He's every boy or girl who yearns for adventure, who thinks this, this can't be all there is. When the Resistance loses Leia, Poe finds himself inheriting a Resistance that's on the brink of collapse. It's clear that Leia had been grooming him for leadership, but what he, he doesn't even know if there's anything to lead at this point. That scene wasn't originally in the, in the film, and uh, I talked to JJ about, well, I think that there, it'd be great to just see a moment that Poe has with Leia even just a moment for him to say goodbye. That speaks to JJ's ability to try things. I'm not ready. Neither were we. And so out of that moment of goodbye, Lando shows up and reminds him about family and about friends and about not being alone. We had each other. We were friends. It turned into this catalyst for you know what, we still have a shot. Something as large as Star Wars, which is a very, very complicated kind of movie, it really needs a lot of people all working together to make it come to, to make it happen. You know, the ending, the last couple of reels of this movie, the number of people who are involved in getting those parts of the story to work and to make sense and to feel revelatory and believable and uh, there's so many people involved we're all in this together and it feels like a real team like kind of like the way star wars is you feel like you're working on something bigger than yourself you want to respect what's come before working towards that blend of legacy and, and new. We strive to have a great balance of those two things. The balance of the force is never a permanent, enduring thing. So the idea that this is a story of a character who needs to step up and bring balance in her own way. If you had asked me, you know, in the middle of doing Seven, where would we go with Ray? I would say that the, the headlines would be exactly the same. As we needed our Sith throne, I'd always been very fascinated by this wonderful sketch that Ralph Macquarie did. It felt like a spiky shadow emerging from the back of a conversation between the Emperor and Vader. The big question was, how do you turn a black pencil drawing that's one and a half inches across as a silhouette into a throne that's his own thing? Because it was done in a two-dimensional pencil sketch, if there was another thing that came out here, even. Like, when you, if you started to feel like it wasn't completely flat. Most of these things are rather hazy. They, they just feel right, you know, sometimes, and sometimes they don't. So you just keep fiddling until they start to feel right. You know, we'll see even if there's kind of bits doing that, maybe in the ground near it and up there. The throne, as we say, envelops around you to make it feel like it's grabbing her. The hope at the beginning of the film that Sidious articulates is that the dyad would come together on the dark side, but the reversal is that the dyad does come together and it is as powerful as we expected, but they come together on the side of the light. One of the surprises and delights for me personally is seeing Adam get to play Ben in this film. The great tragedy is that we don't have him for very long in the story, but when you do, you know, you just, you feel the potential of the, you know, the person he could have been. Before, there's someone who has the absence of hope. And the thing that we star started with for who has been then is someone who has hope. There's no more ambiguity about what it is that he has to do. There's no more seesaw that's happening. For the first time, someone who's never had the answer now finally knows his purpose or destiny. He has to let her know that, that they're together. But I don't know that he entirely is sure what's going to happen from there. 
nor do I think he cares. I think it's so long as he's with her, he's on the right path. Leia's Jedi trial happens in episode nine. The end of her path as a Jedi is fulfilled when her son turns back to the light. We had this crazy idea about doing a cavalry ground invasion on a Star Destroyer surface. That's so cool. So our challenge is how to make 300 feet worth of a Star Destroyer that we can have two armies fighting on and a cavalry charge with horses. Wow, is that amazing? <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> no, but it's really insane. I know. Because we could do a cool thing where we pull them down mm. and have our characters slide them and they like land on a vertical thing mm. that's now more horizontal. At that point, they're just kind of standing on something and at a certain point, they'll jump off onto a platform that's meant to be the Falcon. Go! The idea of having humans and human-sized uh, creatures ground invading a Star Destroyer was too much fun, an idea not to try. So we've been doing a lot of dynamic movements on this lovely beast here. It's like ballet on top of a ballback. Perfect. Yeah, that's it. You're just going to drop that left knee to the, to the ground. Yeah. Yeah, and then go for a grab on the knee. I've never gotten shot before in a movie, so we'll see how it goes. Bang, bang. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go to it, go to it. Bang, bang. More importantly, I'm just not. after she gets shot, she screams. It's a full mark. It's a full mark. Cover, cover me, cover me. Yeah. Come on. He's been trying to get his name in the movie. Yeah. It's like, important. I'm, I'm like, trying to get a doll. For, like, he's trying to get the name. Important. Like, we'll get it. I always wanted this to happen. I always wanted there to be some form of a stormtrooper rebellion, which is something that um, I was quite interested in since seven. And it felt like JJ was going towards that anyway. Give me sick. In the So it feels good to finally be here, to be on the horses. We've been training for this for a long time. I'm on the ground, making sure I blow everything up, posing the sky. Oh, yes, right, please. <laughs> Here we go, here we go. And action. All wings, cover that lander. Watch those two on your tail. What really excited me on Seven was the idea that we would put cameras, fixed cameras, on CG X-wings. Because if you really had an X-wing, what would you do? Well, you'd mount the camera on, possibly on a wing, and you'd fly around sort of recreating a practical way of photographing something, but inside the computer. Incoming ties. Flying along, good and good. Incoming ties. And when I showed it to some of the guys that had worked on the original movies, they were excited about what we were doing. Just keep doing the controls. What can we do against these things? They were saying that they were actually trying to do that when they were making four. Red 2, standing by. It's so funny and nice to come back to it. I was looking for a kind of sailor's outfit, like a, an admiral. It's down to the orange jumpsuit again. I... <laughs> Look at the size of that thing. Mr. Dennis Lawson, <laughs> legend. Thank you. They didn't have a miniature that was big enough, because obviously with miniatures, you have an issue with physically the size of the camera. You've got two black people leading the cavalry, which is something you don't see in every single feature film. At all. So for me and Naomi, we are definitely, we have that in mind, that this is a passionate moment for us. Yeah. Seeing a black man and a black woman lead a cavalry of heroes. Yeah, to say I'm thing. proud. Yeah. I'm me proud. too. Woo-hoo! <laughs> hey! Hell yeah! Hell yeah! We've done a lot of work, innit? Hey! Oh. Hey! <laughs> it's been a joy working with her. We always have a good time, always good conversation. Probably singing and dancing half of the time. <laughs> you know, chilling, talking about, you know, chicken and chips, and next second you're saving the world. It's definitely the underdogs, the little guys. And certainly, while a, a different thing than the Ewoks on Endor. 
but our yeah. new stormtroopers in red. This is the first time yeah, I'm actually seeing them, which is really, really cool. The idea that, that people of human scale can undo a machine of impossible scale definitely feels like it's a theme of, of this series. Each character on Exegol is really facing their greatest challenge. Teamwork. Teamwork is a big thing with this. And so it takes great courage for Ray even to enter that place. Similarly, it takes great courage for Poe to face off against the most dizzying array of Star Destroyers. And great courage for Finn to go off that troop carrier and, and charge you know, onto the surface of a Star Destroyer. Watch this. This is going to trip you out some time. <laughs> OK, here we go. <laughs> This set is absolutely amazing. I'm glad that as an actor I can come on and see the environment, be in the environment, and interact with it. It just makes this very, very real. Just running like away from, a, from an explosion. <laughs> just a little run with an explosion behind us. Like, as soon as the explosion happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Through to the finish, through to the finish. You know what it is? Because you've got all the extras there who are, like, really going through. It's looking great, it's looking great. Once the crew kind of disappears and the, and the shot starts, you feel like you're just there. You just go for it. John William music, proper Star Wars. Oh, I felt that. <laughs> yes, he I felt it. Is. <laughs> this is unbelievable. No, no, you, you have to look at this. Okay. It's so good. Okay, okay, just watch it. It's nuts. So look, I mean, the whole thing was crazy. Yes. The take we just done yeah. before, yeah? Yeah. We stopped and we were just like, Whoa! Whoa! let's go again. <laughs> it's always a funny thing working with people who you like as much as these people. The day is done! It is a bit yeah. like being in a family, <laughs> but it, it's, it's really a bit like being a parent. Seriously. You ideally love the people that you're with, and then your kids go away. <laughs> JJ and I were having a lot of trouble with the end of the film at one point in the process and Rick Carter said to us, I think it's because you two don't want Star Wars to be over. Mm. You don't want the Skywalker saga to be over, yeah. so you don't you don't really want to write it. And I, I think there was a lot of a lot of truth in that. You run in, you're like, Joey! <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit in shock that we're about to wrap. I feel so grateful and lucky that we have gotten this far, that our crew is so extraordinary and to see what they've been able to achieve. And it's just getting sad to think about parting ways and saying goodbye. Black Ram! Action! I had a day off work, so I came to visit my friend J.J. Abrams. And now we've won a rebellion. <laughs> the fact that we are getting to the end definitely is bittersweet. Not getting to work with these people uh, day after day, that will hurt. But I feel lucky that I've gotten to come back to work on this again at all. I mean, every day I've been here has been a professional and personal gift of a lifetime. 
to feel like I am a real part of this long, beautiful lineage, and a part of concluding that story has been surprising and completely fulfilling and so profound. I got to do a scene with Kelly just right now at the end of the movie where it's kind of like my life. Like, things have kind of fallen apart a little bit, but we're still here. And it's still important that we're here, even though we miss our loved ones. And it's kind of like a perfect scene for me to do. This was so magical. I love Kelly so much, and it was such... Oh my God, that was so weird. Did you just cue her? Did you, I literally was like, I love Kelly. They said, what's the best moment? Oh, I was like, up. it's this moment right oh, now. That's so sweet. It really does feel like the culmination of six years of my life just... It's weird. And then, and then you stop and you see her, and then you, and when Finn sees her, we go this, and then you guys head off. You know, yeah. you guys come together. I was going through it thinking, God, could I have done anything differently? But I know I've put the work in. Like, I could not have worked harder. I don't think I could have enjoyed it anymore either. The most heartwarming thing is the collaboration within these studios and these sets and the crew. And you make friends who become family, and that's something for me that's just a, a, a big major thing to let go. Because, you know, this doesn't rep just represent the story, this also does put an end to a kind of season in our lives. Thank you so much for all of your work and your patience and your focus and your dedication and your the honesty and the uh, camaraderie. I mean, all of it reads uh, like you are this um, family. I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. So cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a rock. Thank you for watching me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The analogy to me is, is uh, graduation. You know, you, it's like being in your senior year. You're, you're glad that you're finishing, but savoring every moment because you know it is the last. It's been a really fun project to, to bring Luke Skywalker's home back to life here in Pinewood Studios. JJ was really keen to be faithful to the originals and to have nice callbacks to them. There's a famous shot of Luke sort of leaning over it and talking to his aunt. And we want to try and get that same call back with Ray looking in over the shoulder. Ah! I don't like it! <laughs> You're gonna love it! I don't like it either! I'm not naturally a hugely adventurous person. I just think it's a dark lord, isn't that enough? <laughs> It takes me a long time to get over things in general, fear in general. Oh, oh I really don't like it. It'll be alright. Alright. I really don't like it. <laughs> that's it. With everything you just did, oh, that's it. Back to the water. Get that? <laughs> Behind the scenes, don't never show that bit. Never show that. <laughs> this is horrible. Eunice came up and made a point, which is, this is how we met Ray on a sled. Obviously, I had thought about it, but not really the cyclical thing of starting and ending a story in the same way. You know, it's genuinely amazing to see this. It didn't have a blaster hole in it the first time. This was the first set I ever saw out in Tunisia. And now here we are at the end of it all. And I've got to say, mm, kind of a little bit... Uh, not sad, wistful, I suppose. We thought we'd finish off Star Wars exactly as it's supposed to be. Miniatures, Tatooine, the whole thing. Yeah, they, they look, look back, back and then back to the fire. Rack and and that's fine, yeah. yeah. Copy so, yeah, under six. Okay, guys, go on again when you're ready. The giant track and the Jawas next to it. Um, Jawas, Jawas. 
everything is summed up in those moments and it's part of this book ending what started so long ago. You want to make sure that you're ending the Skywalker saga in a way that feels fitting and emotional and gratifying. You know, the end of this saga has to feel surprising but also inevitable. That when you when you look through it again, you think of of course that's how it had to end. Of course that's where these characters had to go. Of course that's how we had to leave this galaxy. It is incredibly surreal to work on a Star Wars movie at all. To work on a Star Wars movie where you're recreating the homestead where Luke was raised and, you know, on Tatooine is just is obviously uh, as surreal as, as anything. Yeah, but also, look, double. See the other one? It's crazy, isn't it? The idea that Rey is there. It feels like, you know, despite everything we've seen her go through and, and all we've done, there is something about that that feels primal and inevitable and really lovely. I think Star Wars uniquely in its mythology is about cycles of life and teachers, mentors, parents, children. It's got that generational aspect to it. There is this idea of the handing on of sabers and the handing on of a Jedi legacy. And so we have that, I think, as a generation that has inherited the characters and the stories. Just like in Star Wars, it's a privilege and it's a responsibility. Take your saber, work at it. Doing it felt really emotional, because it's like a lovely emotional thing anyway. And it's uplifting and it's a proper end, like it is a story end. It's not tune in for the next episode sort of thing. Ray Skywalker. Cut. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was great, Jay. Beautiful. Nice. Come on. I think everybody recognized that there are giants whose shoulders they're standing on, and a story that's informing who these characters are. My young Jedi. I like these films. I like that I was there. We all realized that it would take more of these films to bring the story full circle. To see not just my character, but every last character that you've been introduced to since the very beginning find their destiny. It's exactly how it had to be. It just goes by so quickly once they're in and getting the shots and stuff. And then it's all still again afterwards. Which is sad. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad that we have to tear it down. That's the thing about movies. I always like Really? We built this amazing thing and now we have to tear it down. Well, last time ever. <laughs> now this is the last uh, shot. Last shot for 3 p.m. last shot for me. So it ends 44 years.
when the actors came in, we would measure their heights. So they would stand by the door and we would put a little, and then put their initials. There's Daisy, Alden from Solo. So I don't know who gets this door now that we're gonna be, here's uh, Donald Glover. Looking for Carrie Fisher. Pretty amazing door. doesn't love speeder chase. It is part of the Star Wars movies. I immediately went back to the speeders in Return of the Jedi. We did so much twisting and turning. We're all trying to be magicians. Every trick in the book is being used. If you wanted to be traveling at 100 miles an hour, how would you photograph it? This is supposed to be the same color as the one we used in seven, but on this monitor it doesn't look the same. We had to come up with sort of the character for the speeders to begin with. These speeders are sort of, um, you know, pieces of junk, really. They're very sort of derelict. That blue one is very cool. The front of it is so Yeah, really great. These are all super 70s. It, it, it does look the most 70s to me. Let's just, for a second, let's go with that one. Let's say it's B for now. Let's look at the other ones. Yeah, it's very cool. ever since I was a kid. I spent my entire life working on bikes. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Thankfully, I've just got to make sure it looks good and bits don't fall off. Today we're building a motion base to call it the XY rig. And we went along to Pinewood and we checked it out and see what it was capable of. This motion base will drive the motion of the speeder. So we're trying to test it before we have to ship it off to Jordan. Be set. I take that animation that has been given to us by ILM, place it on the technical rig, and start evaluating whether it will run in the real rig. I make the adjustments necessary to make it slow enough for the machine to achieve it, and then export that data to special effects. We can guarantee that we're going to get the same motion back when we get the actual footage, and add all our little CG bits in the background. Rig it, say. We will be able to put the speeders on a chassis and be able to drive them around. We're basically trying to test the vehicles in certain situations where they're going to be used in exactly the same in Jordan. Every day's a good day in the office and you can't really complain driving these. It's good fun. Should we take it apart? No, let's not take it apart. Hey, hey, <laughs> come on, let's take this apart. <laughs> Don't see much, but it's alright. Then we'll let the bikes have another run through. They are snowmobiles converted to run on the opposite conditions they're supposed to. We just need to get these vehicles tested the best we can, because they've got to get packed up, and I think it's going to take four to six weeks to get them to Jordan. We did a bit of a test of it flying through a CG environment, and JJ was thinking, this is, you know, this is great, but how actually are we going to shoot this? I just thought it would be a good idea to go through these speeder chase boards and any other Jordan questions we may have before our Jordan friends head out. Our department, we're happy with the vistas there. We can find some nice stuff in the background. You seem quite happy with it as well. It's good. It's a good run. When we were out there, there was so much curvature and personality. So the thing for me is if we pick one place that the dunes can do something cool. It only needs to be 50 feet, whatever you guys call 50 feet. <laughs> Before we do shots like this, we'll get a helicopter pilot in, all of us guys in a group together, off the radios, you know. Not sort of, just guys do it. A guy, well, you know, guys. Guys is plural, it's both genders in this show. <laughs> what we're doing is we're building a track. We're building two, in fact. 
One's going to be a camera track and one's going to be a vehicle track. We've got a six axis rig with six degrees of movement. So we've got a, a rotate, an up and a down, and this one also goes side to side. It's a very powerful machine because it's hydraulics, but because it's hydraulics also, it's not quite like an electrical system where it's very precise on what you want it to do because you run out of oil, you run out of pressure. It can be quite difficult. We built ourselves a kind of green screen stage here in Jordan Desert in one of the wadis here. So we get five shooting days here, Tuesday through Saturday, on the uh, XY rig for all the actors' coverage of the speeder chase. Daisy on the speed. <laughs> Ray. Daisy hooking in. Ray. <laughs> yeah, Ray. It's Ray or nothing. And so a couple days in, I remember walking over to JJ and saying, "Hey JJ, so I noticed that you know we're doing green screen," and uh, and he's like, "So why are we? Why the hell are we in the desert?" And I'm like, "Yeah." I know it does seem nuts to be in this location and be shooting against green screen. Why would you build a green screen in the desert? And the reason we're here, we're trying to make this as realistically as possible. And it's really difficult to recreate a fabulous sunny day in Jordan. Come on, right, here we go. Correct lighting is the foundation, I think, of good visual effects. You can color correct all day, you can do every sort of digital trick in the book, but the reality is, if it's in front of you and it's there, you know what you're getting, it integrates better. And obviously the more sort of you can shoot everything in the same environment, the better it will look in the end when you comp everything in together, so that's why they shot it on location there. These kind of gimbal-y things that rocked the ship around in quite a violent way, you know. Eunice, the stunt coordinator, she said, we'll be tying you on. And I'm going, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be tied on. <laughs> you know, there's no messing with Eunice. I was tied on. It has been very hard work. I was in the foulest, foulest mood, because <laughs> I had no idea how difficult it would be. But now everything's settled, and it's a bit cooler, and we're all feeling great. We lose them. It's like, you know, looks like it, and, and then you look back, and then boom, boom, boom. It's like, nope, yeah. nope, 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 still there. Always like going on location, it gives a much more real gravity to the scene. I understand it more. I feel like I'm really in the environment. I'm wearing the costumes, loads of explosions, stunts. Explosion, explosion. All of that, all of that. This is like the Star Wars version of the ultimate car chase. JJ's. <laughs> His brain works at 200 miles an hour, so you've got to keep up. So I'm sitting there literally going, OK, yeah, yeah, and then a close-up, and then she looks back, and then we pull here, and he's, he's like 10 shots ahead of me. <laughs> I drew this myself <laughs> while I was waiting for you guys to film the movie. I, I always love making discoveries, planning things as much as we can, and, of course, you storyboard and you shot list. But the truth is that when you're on the set, you discover things that you know you need that you never would have known. He's driving along, right? He makes I a spin. turn. <laughs> I'm at him when, he's, when he's right around here, the thing hits. And that's behind it. You're looking back over your left shoulder. Over left shoulder. Yeah. 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 Uh, Boom. Uh, that. No, I missed this part. <laughs> and then the whole thing comes around like that. Twice? Well, you, we're doing just the second half. Just the second half. Yeah, and it's like, so still see it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, the shot is the woohoo. Woohoo! <laughs> exactly. It's so normal. So interestingly, we need to turn the whole speed around. <laughs> it was really exhilarating. For me, it was the most fun I've had. <laughs> uh, but it's a bit challenging because they'd have fans as well. And so you just have all this sand getting into your eyes. And uh, I'd go home after after some days and just like tons of sand would be pouring out of my hair. Plug, 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 plug. And you see Ray and you wave. CLG ship. Here comes the jetpack. Shoot. Three, two, one, boom! man will be right up in here, sort of towards the edge, further in. Mining his business. The shot's here, we don't know what he's looking at. And then it just goes like that. There we go, there's our vehicles for uh, discussing all the moves. So the bad guys don't do that. The bad guys just like, boom, right away make a decision. And... No one ever knew how useful they'd be. <laughs> So 
with so many variables, you know. Uh, we've got helicopter work here, drones, ground vehicles, ground cameras, it's set to build and dress here. There's, there's so many different factors. We are currently in the Vaporator Dust Farm. They are legacy items from the original films. Visual effects have done studies on the computer to have the correct distance for the evaporators for the speed of each car so that you can see them nicely when the cars drive through. Claire and her unit were kind enough to not only make the first and last evaporators movable, they're all movable, unbelievably kind. Make your mark and then shoot. What's fun about second unit is, you know, we would go in first and we get to explore it in its raw state. We would do tests. It's not really a secret by now. I mean, most of the crew knows that I was a kid who rode BMXs off of docks into the water, and I learned how to ride a bike by the bike that didn't have tires and it didn't have brakes. And I rode down the hill because I needed speed, and I used the fence to stop myself. My elbows, my face, my knees busted, but I knew how to ride a bike. So. Part of why I was excited to come when JJ called was that most of the stuff that we're doing, the stunts, there were things I could play with that I felt like that's my special sauce. Right there's the bike. Oh, come on. Hey! That was really, really damn good. <laughs> First, first day, you know, there's a beat where we're on flat land and the red and blue hero speeder were flying at the speed of light. And it was just this incredible shot. And it was one of those feelings where we all stopped and just thought, oh, this is Star Wars. It's great, right? They come upon you faster than you think. Our stunt team really took those speeders to the limit. It was a great reference for us to see, well, what would they do in a situation like that, and also be able to capture some of those moments on camera and then digitally transform them into the floating speeders that we all know in this movie. The bad guys are on these kind of weird motorcycle skidoo things. It's pretty good, mate. A bit swirly in places. <laughs> Off road. The trick, I think, is always to find some new kind of interesting angle. That the ours was the idea that these guys had jetpacks. Action! When we tested it in England, <laughs> we did it. 50 times, and then we came here and did it another 10, 15 times, and then we did it twice in costume, and then today we're doing it for real. Where the guys fly in the sky came out really, really good. Eunice and her team took a long time, and then Luke and Dom and those guys, you know, are doing the explosions. You, you want it to be like, you want it to almost like spin. Yeah, like just a bit more but, but, violent. On a lot of stunt action, your wire teams don't get the credit that, that they deserve as well. Your performers do, because they're the ones that are rubbing the bruises the next day. Oh, I did a big gag on Star Wars and all that. And your wire guy's there, and he's, he's like, <laughs> like, like the one that the pressure's on, manipulating them and making them look great, and no one ever understands that as well. The film industry is all about unsung heroes. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that people just don't don't appreciate. It's a great team effort for everyone. If you ask Dominic, he will always say that it's a team effort, Vic. Every time I say anything to him, team effort, Vic, everything. We're like this close to locking the speeder chase. Every shot in this is a visual effect, so we will be uh, well ahead of the game if we can get this to ILM. When you start to see the plates coming back and you realize that all the work was worth it, you know, the setup work, we got some really super dynamic close up shots. And then they start giving us post viz, which puts the backgrounds in, and then we refine it, and start putting sound and music, and it'll really come to life. Instead of me and JJ just sitting here going, and then he goes, woo 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 woo, and then falls down, or there's an explosion. I mean, there's tons more work to do, but it's so amazing when you just start to see it work. The job, I think, that we all have is to make it invisible. So the design of it and the construction of it and the stunts of it and obviously the special effects work is incredible and all the visual effects work. That If everyone does their job right, including the actors, including myself, no one thinks that any of this took place.
obviously there's been a track record of deserts being used in the Star Wars movies to date. And I think it's a lovely sort of harkening back to that history. So scene 54 is the reveal of the uh, festival. And then we find our friends, there's a CG falcon behind them. And we come around the corner with our friends walking. We come around here and we reveal half a million Akiakis and a big festival there. JJ really wanted to set a world for our character Ray to really see for the first time a world full of laughter and life and celebration. So Jordan provided that feeling of a planet worth saving, of a life that was enjoyable to, to live. One of the things that first attracted us to Jordan was the kind of otherworldly quality of the landscape here. The rock formations set in, in vast tracts of desert give you enormous scale. Wadi Ram is magical. There's no competition to that. It even still blows our mind, even as locals, to come here. I've been coming down to Wadi Ram since I was a kid. We'd have birthday parties here, ride camels. It encapsulates a lot of what I love about Jordan. It's a place like nowhere else on Earth. We've had to bring everything with us. We've had to basically build a small town in support of the filmmakers. And it's been almost a civil engineering project for us, really. We've had to bring in water. We've had to bring in plumbing, places for, for people to go, go to the loo, have a shower, and all of our catering. There's a bit over uh, 600 UK crew here and a bit over 200 Jordanian crew. But on certain days, we we're feeding about 1,500 people. Every single bottle, knife, fork, spoon to do with catering will all leave when we finish up. We have 67 Porter Cabin offices here, which were, were built and supplied locally, as well as over 100 shipping containers. 55 of which we, we brought from the UK, with over 550 tonnes of equipment. We have uh, UK nurses arriving. We have Jordanian medics and doctors working with us. And we were able to, to build praying tents for the local crew to be able to, um, uh, to carry out their daily practice. We also involved the Bedouin community. They've been able to detour some of the normal tourist routes to give ourselves a nice filming perimeter. And we've had the most fantastic uh, help from, from the Jordanian army. They're very proud of their country. They're very proud of what they do here. They have a lot of big films come out here to this desert, so they know exactly what they're doing. They've given us access to their ambulance service, the fire service, and loaned us their logistics corps to help us to build roads. We've got like 15 locations in total spread all over the areas and first thing we were thinking is how, how are we going to stop people from getting lost in this desert when they need to access a location. So we came up with what is the ski route system we're calling it now. So basically every single road which leads to a location is, is color coded. So if you want to get to the Shiprock location you look on the map and it's a blue road and we basically put blue posts all the way down and all of the signage corresponding to that is all blue also helps with the environment side of it. One of our key things is site management and stopping people just driving recklessly through the desert because there's plants, there's, there's animals, and we have to just be very respectful of that. We don't have any alien materials that we're building the road with. It's all natural materials from, from close by. It's well protected. As you know, it's a UNESCO heritage site. And then the army will remain with us whilst we remove the roads that we put in and just returning it to the uh, state that we found it in, essentially. And all that support has come directly from the Royal Jordanian Film Commission. One of the unique things about filming in Jordan is the role that the Film Commission plays. It's kind of like a one-stop shop for, for filmmakers. His Majesty the King has been always supportive and believed in this industry. Not only do we function as a film commission, but we also we function in many ways as a second production office. They really took on board what we needed from day one, and we wouldn't have been able to, to do what we're doing here today without them. We're so proud to have Star Wars. We're all such big fans, and to have it here now is such an amazing uh, experience for us. It 
it's an exciting period at the moment. I think we're going to start having a few um, longer days and sleepless nights, but it's a little bit like being the advance party for the circus pulling into town. I'm glad that uh, main unit's almost here. We can finally uh, start work proper. What do you mean? <laughs> Putting up out here for two weeks. Mate, we're ready for main unit. Come on, main unit, bring it on. If you look around the insanity of what's been done here to provide us the ability to shoot three, four units at the same time, main unit, second unit, aero unit, visual effects unit, has been phenomenal. They've never had anything as big as us here, and they've met that challenge full on. Nothing is impossible. And three, two, one, action! This is Uchi's Freighter. It's a bit of visual effects reference. I'm using this as a foreground model. Put the camera at a certain distance from it, and hopefully it will look like it's sitting on the rock. We cannot possibly fly in that old wreck. Uchi Abyssinian's ship is, of course, something that Ray first saw in Episode 7. Although at the time we didn't realize that it was Uchi Abyssinian's ship. I've seen that ship before. <laughs> parents left. They were on that ship. Ochi was a Jedi hunter who was loyal to the Emperor ever since the days of the Empire. He's an evil character who essentially functions as the assassin. He was going to Exegol with Ochi of Vistun. Why was Ochi going there? To bring a little girl he was supposed to take from Jakku to the Emperor. And so in the course of the film, Rey ends up aboard the very ship where her parents were killed. We've been talking about how to make it feel like it's 30 years of abandonment. I would do a pass where we lose as much of the Imperial stuff mm. and just put in just weapons and that kind of stuff. And the idea being that it's of the era of the Falcon, so it's got a very, very retro feel to it, but I was very deliberately wanting to make sure that you never thought you were in the Falcon. This is great. So I was looking at a lot of the original Eagle Lander from NASA, and I found this lovely picture that had yellows and teal, strange colours from the kitchen in my house in 1975, from where my mum was cooking. Watch out for the uh, ramp opening. Our heroes will come in, Poe will sit in the front, and as he turns everything on, the louvers will open up and the light will flood into the ship. It will very clearly be a very Star Wars ship, but hopefully it'll look very new to everybody. Back through to one. Up. And so three, two, one, action! Ochi's ship uh, hasn't been turned on in 30 years. The source for that was a late 60s Camaro. Cut, beautiful, playback. Yeah. That was great, I thought. Hello. 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 No, no, thank you. Looks like someone treated him badly. It's all right. You're with us now. JJ loved this idea of a wheel, and he loved this shape, this pointy shape. It's a simple, simple shape. Obviously, it needs to have a color, and that'll be a lot of it. Always about simple silhouettes. So that's what works beautifully in Star Wars. This much as BB-8, you can distill down to a hemisphere and a sphere. This droid can be distilled down to a triangle and a circle. Wait, what, con face? Deal. Um, the scene on Ochi's Freighter where BB-8 finds Dio and brings him back to functionality. It was quite challenging as well because it was just pure puppetry. It was just we had to get in there and hit the marks and introduce this new character into Star Wars. Like a duckling, he sort of latches onto the first sort of thing he sees. He's a very sort of fun, constantly moving, inquisitive child. It's more of a child than BBA. Hello. No, thank you. No, thank you. We started um, some Dio sound design for his vocals. And that went through a dozen different iterations before we landed on where it is now. Hey, don't touch that. That's my friend. So sorry. She is gone. Yeah, she's gone. I don't know where. I miss her. That's JJ. He kept telling me what kind of voice he wanted. He kept telling me what kind of actor he wanted and different traits of what that droid was like. And in the back of my head, I was like, that actually sounds like JJ. There was a scene I had to do with just Dio. We're in Bubby Freak's workshop. 
and C-3PO, for all we know, is gone. Oh, boy. Like, it's horrifying. So I have to walk away, and I had to sit there, but Dio just goes, squeak, 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 squeak. And JJ was laughing so much. I thought we were never gonna get through it. <laughs> Hey, I'm gonna come this way. I'm doing straight ahead. I'm doing that. And it's just kind of like, he's like, do you notice me? Let's go. Oh my God, I don't know why it's so funny to me. <laughs> One of the things that JJ found hilarious is that I've clearly never oiled anything because he said that I was oiling the yeah, like this. BB-8 has been there for two films. We love him. And he just said, I don't want Ray to be as warm to Dio just yet. And it's so, it was sweet doing it. Squeaky wheel. I have a squeaky wheel. Squeak eliminated. Thank you. Dio, he was just left in neglect on this ship by Ochi Pastoon. And Ray says to him, essentially, you might have had a bad past, but you're with friends now. And that, that sort of is, is the, the feeling of the whole film, that Poe didn't have such a great past, Finn didn't have such a great past, Ray didn't have such a great past, and nor did BB-8. But now that they're together, they're friends, and they're going to look out for each other. Who are you, and what do you want? I'm Warwick, and I want a job. <gasps> Cut it out! Well, it's fun, really. Yeah, it's great fun. But there is a lot of waiting around, you know. You do one if you three work together. One time last you time do your hand stretch. Back in 1981, my grandmother heard a radio commercial in which they were looking for short people to be in the new Star Wars movie. So she told my mum, who then phoned up the studios, and they said, well, we've got everyone we need. We had so many calls. Mum then said that I was a big fan of the films and that I was only 11. And they started to think, actually, maybe we could have some sort of younger Ewoks. Yeah, I need a spear. All we have to do is just go down that path. Because oh, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we're, we're not Are we going to be fighting at all, do you know? Because well, we just run away and that's it. Right, yeah. that's it. Yeah. It's just one scene. Oh, that's easy to yeah. Oh, yeah. Honestly, I never thought I would see the day where I'd be stepping back into these feet and uh, performing Wicket once again. See? I do this for your entertainment. <laughs> Putting this Wicket costume back thing. together is going to be a, a major undertaking for quite a lot of people. It needs to feel the same for you. I think at the minute, I think these going to definitely have to move up onto the top of my head a bit more. Ah, some spear auditions. Yeah, spear or star. <laughs> that's good, I like that one. This is like old wise man. Yeah, that's like Gandalf. Yeah. Yeah. When the fur's on. That's whether you see whether it kind of the shape and everything is working or not. Looking over and seeing my son Harrison there, oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's really, it makes you very proud and uh, evokes a lot of memories of when I was first having fittings. I was excited, but also I didn't really know what I was getting into, whereas Harrison kind of has a better understanding of what he's going into here and the kind of the scale of the whole thing. Warwick's happy. Our actual Ewok is happy with our new Ewok. <laughs> You've got to be pleased with that. <laughs> Team Wicket. How cool is this? Is this crazy? <laughs> I've got long to kind of sell it to the audience, and so little subtle clues in costume, the look of that, and also the set will allow us to do that very quickly. I guess we're calling him Wicket's son. You know, I think in, in reality he's my son, but also in uh, within the Ewok people. tribe, Wicket has indeed things. produced an offspring. Uh, he's older and wiser, and uh, he has a little scamp. To, uh, to handle now. So you can imagine the scale of what you're seeing. Yeah. Huge Star Destroyer, what? like plummeting down. Today we were blessed with two performances from uh, two fine actors. One is a Star Wars vet and one is uh, a new Star Wars vet. I'm immensely proud of Harrison and what he's achieved today. 
you know, cause it's not easy in, in, in this, you know, it's, it's difficult to move, it's extremely hot, you can't see, you can't breathe, and uh, he, did, uh, he did a sterling job. I cannot tell you how wonderful this is. Thank you both for doing it. So how was that? Good. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. I managed to sort of wrangle my way into episode one. I actually had to drop a lot of hints to George all the time, be sort of pestering him, basically. Uh, I used to send faxes back then, say, oh, I hear you're making a new film soon, just remember to kind of write a short character in for me. I mean, it was as blatant as that. I was a Lucasfilm like, oh, we're using a lot of fax paper at the moment. Congratulations, you're liberated. Scoot. But yeah, I never take it for granted either, because they don't have to ask me to do these things. And they don't realise, I don't think, how much pleasure I get from doing it. <laughs> Playing a droid or an alien character or what have you. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I can't... It makes me smile when I think about Star Wars. Come on. Well, this character is very special to me because he gave me the career in acting that I have. You know, without having performed Wicket, I don't think any of the things would have happened to me in my life. It kind of fulfilled a childhood dream to be in Star Wars and then to go on to kind of meet my heroes in the flesh you know in the in the shape of Han Solo, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia I mean it was the most amazing thing in the world. Well I like putting the costume on and that's when I've got it on it feels good and it's just nice to feel that you're in Star Wars and so when you see it in the cinema you'll say it's me and yeah it'll be good. We all work. It wasn't easy, but we couldn't have done it without you. That's all right. Thanks a lot. You worked really hard. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Miss you. Give my love to the Ewoks. Okay. Sure will. What George created with Star Wars was utterly unique. It's not a science fiction film, it's not science fantasy, it's not this, it's not that, it's Star Wars. Give us a bit more then, Pete. Magama! Okay, yeah. Magama! In Star Wars, creatures definitely feel like a theme of, of the series. This amazing puppetry and animatronics is awesome. <laughs> There's a believability in Star Wars. So when approaching a design, we reference animals and familiar things that help that alien to look like you've sort of maybe seen him before somewhere. The head shake is amazing. Yeah. Give a bit more shake, Liam, on the head shake. Drop out of you for the right there. That is so good. Jim Henson, the man who I owe so much to in the fact that he gave me my start in the film industry and always said to him performance was everything. And so to me, when we've created a character, whether it be a droid or whether or not it's a puppet or whether or not it's a, a character that takes 10, 15 puppeteers to bring to life, that is the point in which they bring their skills and their artistry to it. Oh, I'm lovely. <laughs> You guys. <laughs> they are all actors in their own way, and they all have their own personalities. Oh, they my teeth? This is good stuff. Look. I don't know, hey, you know that's not tasty at all. Here it comes. Uh, yes. Together we work as a team and try and make it look as realistic as we can. When you've got the head on, of course, you can feel a little bit isolated. It's really great because I've got Mike in my ear sort of essentially guiding me, that's making sure what, I'm safe. So it's really quite nice to have him there. We can, you know, he keeps me company. Looking amazing, guys. Who's inside today? Uh, Tom. 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 Hello, Tom. Tom is here. Hold well on, Tom. Thanks, Tommy. I do pity the guy inside, though, Tom. He's, uh, he's putting up with a lot of discomfort, a lot of heat and a lot of weight. And walk backwards. It's quite a heavy thing, so uh, it takes a bit of muscle and it's quite uncomfortable. But um, it's all for the... For the love of the movie. He walks backwards. Yeah, he walks backwards. I think at the end of the thing. He's got a little camera right. here. Adam, mm. what is that? <laughs> yeah. That's how you guys do it. Yeah, he's got your pull. Thank you. Well done, Liam. <laughs> Thanks. I'll give you a race. Still quite sweet. Eat your potato. The great thing about all these characters, they have such a different type of personality. Hey. Oh, yeah. We talk about what kind of character these aliens are, if they're a villain or good or you don't trust him, or if he's a pirate alien. 
We are a manufacturing process ultimately. Everything we make has to go through a series of processes in order to be realized as a Star Wars character. They're all pretty much a bit of a collaboration. Each one gets weirder and more wonderful creatures. Yeah. <laughs> this is Claude. It's a nice process to see from beginning to end. You get your performer in it and they bring it all to life. Neil loves a good show and tell, doesn't he, Fiona? He does. <laughs> it's very exciting, very enthusiastic. Let's go, Paul. One screen. <laughs> I love the creatures. I actually treat them like they're creatures, like for real. Look straight, yeah, that's it. What I love about Star Wars is that you're dealing with a healthy use of practical effects, which is brilliant. And so this is a good opportunity for us as actors to react off real stuff. Practical effects is what Star Wars was all about originally. You know, things like the Rancor and Torn Torn and Stop Motion. This time around, we're trying to do as much as we can practically. Mass, for instance, is a character that we all know from Force Awakens. Mass, up to this point, was computer generated. And with the animatronic version, we had one person in a motion capture suit doing the upper body. When I pop into her, she picks up all of my breath. If I move my head slightly, it really follows. And we had a person lip sync live and perform the mouth, which is a bit like puppeteering a sock puppet, but actually doing it through two mechanical gloves. Ooh. It really is incredible. You want to take a photo? I would love to. If I it's extra money for a photo. <laughs> <laughs> I love the stand up Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Just put a brick wall behind it. You know, I'm here all week, try to be. It's really good. This is for you. As many expressions we got in here, sometimes they need that specific expression that maybe our mechanics lack. Then CG comes in, which I'm totally fine with because, especially on this film, it's been an amazing collaboration where we help each other out. We rely so heavily on all the brilliant people at ILM. I can say to Roger Guyat, who's the visual effects supervisor, there's a puppeteer on here with a rod, do you mind getting rid of him later? And it's like, no, no, we'll get rid of that. So that relationship is one that is very, very close, obviously creatively and economically, that has ramifications. There are other native people we could have on ordinary naked horses, and Roger could help us out yes. later on. Copy that. OK, uh, it's 1.35. <laughs> I... <laughs> We've got Orbax, which are these horse-like creatures. And in creating what these Orbax are, we actually used real live horses. We took our horse team that worked with Creature Effects to be able to dress them, give them extra hair and costumes. So the boot Velcro's on, and then the suit Velcro's on top of that. We all had to think about horse temperature, We've got to make sure they don't overheat. So this suit is specifically for Ben's. He is the hero horse for Naomi. He's the most decorated because she's the leader. We tried to make the mask originally, but we couldn't do the mask because the sort of practicality of the horse running and how much you could see. It was too difficult, it was too limitating. We couldn't, we couldn't do it practically. Should we do some designs for getting the actual geometry of the horse head? I'd yep. say, what would the thing look like? Yep. Well, ideally. So our team here had to study what kind of uh, characteristics they had in the hair and also you know, add all the detail that we would see on a real-life animal like twigs, mud and uh, blades of grass so that they feel like living, breathing animals. The best thing, I think, the ears. The animators and VFX hoops were obsessed over the animation of the ears. I think it came out quite successfully. Um, <laughs> It looks like twitchy ears. I guess the best thing about the Orbex is the sound because we have no idea what sound it makes. Something like, uh, no, I'm not doing that. Orbex are noisy eaters. What sound they make? Um, I think. Now the vacuum, now the vacuum. Now the vacuum. Star Wars invites you into a galactic world that you can be part of. I don't know of any other film genre that does that as successfully as Star Wars.
to Star Wars 9. Good morning, everyone. We're starting our new Star Wars adventure today, as you probably have noticed. When Kathy Kennedy called and said, would you work on episode nine, literally one of the first things that crossed my mind was that I would get to work with John again. Like literally it was one of the things I thought, oh my God, I cannot not do this. So we're gonna play now the first piece then. 1976, when I was 12. <laughs> okay. And it sounds like this. getting to watch him conduct, hearing the music that he's written, being part of at all his remarkable body of work was just an opportunity I could not possibly say no to. To go back to the beginning, the first day we did Star Wars was the first day that a trumpeter called Morris Murphy had been admitted as a member to the London Symphony Orchestra. So the first service he did was Star Wars recording number one, and he came into the stage and blew that top C, which sort of blew the world's head off. I've had the good fortune of working with John for most of my career. He's been actively involved in all the Star Wars movies, and he consistently finds these incredible themes. And you sit there saying, how in the world does he do this? Hey! Hey! Listen to me, Chewie! This is marvelous. This is very touching here, I think. Old combination. I, I need you to protect her. All that. I love that. Well, I don't like to read scripts. Reading anything, we form our own sort of vision of what things look like. I'd rather look at a film and be surprised at what's happening and remember those moments that are revelatory. I love you. I know. <laughs> what are you going to say? Yeah. I love you too, Violin. <laughs> The process for me is if I have to go to the piano and start to work. I can't do it thinking about it or walking around the room or walking in the trees. I have to go to the piano, start to write something that isn't very good, look at it the next day or a week later and try to make it better. I will take scene by scene. I will write a few bars and then go look at what I've done on the screen and rework it. He writes and then he, he goes to the piano every once in a while and makes sure that he's still in the same key and he comes back and he writes some more. Great composers all wrote that way. He still writes by hand. He doesn't compose out of computer. I mean, technology can change the picture, but John's thematics, it's the same brilliance as it was for the first one. It's hard to believe that it's been 40 years since we began this. This is a unique opportunity where a composer can keep working on the same body of work and continue to add to it. What a privilege is that? Play, play one of them. Up, down, up. One, two. What if it's just reversed? One of the challenges has been, should it be so new that it doesn't fit the body? Can you play Ray's theme alongside of Leia's theme and have them be the same part of the family, even though I'm 40 years older? So far, they all seem to want to live together. With Ray, writing a theme for her, she was little more than a child in number seven. Her metamorphosis, if you like, from seven to nine, she's an adult now. She's become a magnificent woman. I can treat it in the orchestra so that it's in a more grown-up way. So you will hear it, but it's not quite as simply presented. The changes of Ray, they are part and parcel and in tandem with the changes of Adam Driver's character to something heroic. I could turn Ren's theme around, not upside down, but reharmonize it, which is actually JJ's idea. He said to me, well, can you make the trip from Ren to Ben on the same theme? 
It's the same thing, exactly. Yeah. Just treat it differently. No, I, I, but however you do it, but, but that idea of, 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 of the, you know, he's trying his, his hardest now to be the best he can be, as opposed to he's trying his hardest to be as bad as he can be, which is the only thing he's been doing. Can you change the theme, turn it upside down or something? And I think I initially said, well, no, I've never done that, and how do you do it? But it worked out where his evil theme morphs brilliantly into a kind of a hero theme by a change of harmonic support and so on. The Emperor's theme, which was a little motif really, meaning a sort of short theme, the presentations of it in this film are more numerous. It always made me smile a little bit. I don't know. It's supposed to be very nasty. I think it's very powerful, these challenges of force against force that our heroes bring up against the, the old powerful one. I am all the Sith. mistaken for Steven Spielberg at the gate. <laughs> Seriously. It's a good said, Do you have an ID? And I said, I left it at home. I said, any chance you recognize me? He said, oh, you're Steven Spielberg. <laughs> I, I wish I'd said yes. <laughs> and I missed that opportunity. It came this close. How many scenes have we scored with this guy in it? <laughs> Yoda lifts it in the Empire Strikes Back. Romero Belgard, the music editor, he said, oh, it should be exactly the music that we had for Yoda. And actually, JJ questioned it. He said, well, is that, should we be doing that right? And everybody said, oh, yes, it has to be. It's, you know, the fans will all know. So we went back to the score of Empire Strikes Back to get those bars exactly out of them. That actual little central piece of taking the ship up is exactly as we had it before. It's an exception, the use of something literal from an earlier film. We're visiting specific themes, you know, I'm happy to do it. It's great to see these characters revisited here. Brings us to Carrie, of course. We see her in the film, and we hear her theme referred to. And I feel very good about it. It's nice that she's still with us anyway and part of it. I just think the last couple of words of the film are so completely magical. We have to have 40 years of preparation for that to get the full feeling of what that means. I felt so satisfied and so complete in a way. Who are you? I'm right. Nine episodes in a great tale, beautifully done over many, many years. And that means that it's not an ending. It is here with us and it will stay there and makes our lives part of that story. Ray Skywalker.
The last day of recording on films like this is always a little bit emotional. There's a sense of satisfaction coming to the end of the musical journey of it. But there's also a little sense of feeling sorry that we won't be meeting again next week to record some more Star Wars music. I would be quite happy to have it go on indefinitely. I feel like we've been together for a very, very long time. I really will miss seeing you. I wish we had more to play, but I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity to be with you. Bravo, thank you for your artistry and for your obvious love of music. Thanks so much.